10 o'clock hour and I want to thank everyone for their attendance today um, at this uh, board meeting and we will call this meeting to order and take please take the roll supervisor Howard here supervisor Starkey here supervisor short here supervisor Borges here chair Wilson here and we please take a moment of reflection Thank you. And Supervisor Short, you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Yes, sir. Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Do we have any introduction of new employees today? Not today, Chair. Thank you. Anything to report out of closed session? No, Chair. Thank you. Chair, to then request any uh, deletions, corrections, actions uh, from the board members on the agenda at this time. In order to add an agenda, uh, add up to the agenda, this matter must have come before the attention of the county subsequent to the board uh, posting of the agenda, and the matter requires action before the next regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors. Any such action? Seeing none. We shall receive brief reports, announcements relative to Delaware County programs and projects, process two by two committees, goal committees, and the board staff, and training reports. Supervisor Starkey, can you start us off? Please? Certainly, thank you, Chair. Um, so in the last couple of weeks, I continued to work on domestic violence related issues within our community. Um, aside from having that luncheon, I'm now starting to meet individually with the people who attended that luncheon so I can take a deeper dive and identify the gaps in services and where we can improve and stop being the number one in the state with the number of calls for service for domestic violence related offenses. Um, I met with the DA investigator as well as employees at Harrington House in order to get a deeper understanding of the needs of the community. And I, I do plan to reach out to Amanda over there as well. Um, I presented for a NACO webinar, um, which highlighted key insights um, gleaned from the county elected officials who participated in reaching rural and how the county elected officials were navigating through that with regard to the participation in that. So it was great that NACO had invited me to do that webinar. I attended the equity council meeting for California's job first and um, from California's jobs first our team has submitted a proposal into the portal for the California jobs first initiative um, for those of you that recall our, our team who's comprised of Redwood Parks Conservatory the city uh, some trail enthusiasts through enthusiasts around the community true north and myself we've been working on an idea that would connect communities within Del Norte County with mountain bike trails but also how we can reach out to the um, neighboring counties that are in part of the Redwood Rise region which is Humboldt Mendocino and Lake County uh, the city is partnering with that on for that because they are requesting funding for the Discovery Center, which we believe will be the hub of these connected communities. Each uh, county should have a Discovery Center of sorts that we refer each other back and forth. It would help aid in a carbon neutral tourism uh, draw to our region. I attended the Area One Public Forum events in both Del Norte County and Humboldt County. Um, Area 1 is now in their four-year plan, uh, and so they're trying to identify services that are working and services that are still needed. Uh, so both those meetings were well attended at both, uh, and they were both held at our senior centers. And uh, one of the things that came from it is the, the need for transportation. Seniors get very isolated at times. And so just a need for transportation. So on, on Thursday, um, April 11th, from 1.30 to 3 at our senior center, we're hosting a volunteer um, session where people can come and decide if they want to volunteer in transporting these seniors to just everyday errands. Um, 
so if you are interested, there is some uh, reimbursement for gas mileage, but otherwise it's a, a volunteer position. But I also just want to take a moment to remind the community that the Redwood Coast Transit Authority um, offers a medical transport to Grants Pass and to Medford twice a week. And doctors in our area are providing vouchers, so it could be free of charge if you get a voucher from your doctor. Um, but even if you don't get that voucher, it's a modest amount. I think it's $12 round trip, maybe $20 round trip to Medford. So um, something to just kind of keep out there and I think spreading it around to make sure that people understand there is this service available, not only for seniors, but for anybody that needs to go outside the area for medical treatment. Um, another concern was the lack of way that we get information to our seniors. Um, a lot of them don't have social media. Um, my dad is on social media, and sometimes that's not always a good thing. Um, but <laughs> I have to like and comment on his stuff. Um, but so we're working on providing a television in the senior center that will loop the flyers. So as you are creating events that perhaps even our seniors might be interested in is to uh, get that flyer to the senior center so that we can include that on the loop of things that they can do in the community. I attended the local behavioral health board meeting and there was a lot to update. I'm gonna run through it fairly quickly. We updated on the NAMI, the National Alliance for Mental Illness. We have a chapter here working. The next meeting is April 22nd from 6.30 to 7.30 at 710 8th Street. There was an update on Care Court. Uh, Care Court is due to go live here in Del Norte County on December 1st, 2024. Um, the currently behavioral health staff is coming up with guidelines for who can apply, who can assess, and the process in which petitions make their way through our system. And, um, you know, I know that we've been working on getting a public defender, but I think it's very important to make sure that we work as diligently as possible to get that public defender in place because I think they're going to have such a key role in developing our local response for care court. Um, we got an update on Proposition 1 reform. So next week when some of us are attending the CSAC legislation conference, there'll be a session which will hopefully kind of outline how some of these changes may impact our rural community. We do uh, are looking into an exemption for small communities, but we need to kind of dial in what those are and how they're gonna impact us. Um, our concern is the biggest impact is going to be for prevention programs, especially for our youth. And so how can we keep those uh, sustainable? There was an update on the crisis care implementation plan, implementation plan, sorry. It's scheduled to go live uh, July 1st of this year. Um, so we're trying to determine how calls will be dispatched out, who's going to take that initial call. The call will take about a half hour. So we are looking at ways in which we are not tying up our particular dispatch for that call. So those are some pieces that we're trying to put into place in order for this to be a successful model of people responding to mental health crises that are happening in our community to try and help avoid them going to jail or to the ER. And we got an update on the behavioral health bridge housing. So that is support for people who are homeless that have mental health issues. So the county has secured two homes which can house up to eight to 10 individuals. They are working on hiring staff to be a housing navigator and uh, staff is working through some of the final steps in writing the policy for this program. I received a constituent call from a man whose fiance was hiking up a hill on Pebble Beach uh, Drive and she was stuck with a needle. And now she's having to undergo, you know, protocols for six months for testing for either hep C or HIV and those sort of things. And, you know, we're hoping that she'll be okay. But given this information, um, it just may be prudent for the county to begin looking at ways to safely dispose of needles. So that's just something I just want to kind of put out there that might be on our radar in the future. Um, we certainly don't want anybody to get hurt or stuck with needles. And then finally, I met with representatives from Assemblymember Wood, Congressman Huffman, and President Pro Tem McGuire's office when I was down attending the Area One Agency Aging meeting in Humboldt. Um, I asked if they had an opportunity to meet with me, and I got to meet with all three of them at one time. And so we were able to get some more information relative to some um, OES funding, 
get some updates on Pebble Beach Drive, as well as here uh, officially uh, that the 500,000 we were awarded from the state funding that will make improvements to Pike Field. So we're very excited about that. And that is my report. Supervisor Howard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, kick off my report with um, a success, I think, that we've had with the Local Transportation Commission here after several years of pushing for improvements on Highway 101 north of Dr. Fine Bridge at two major intersections, one being Timbers Boulevard and um, Timber Boulevard and Highway 101, which is the Dollar General location, and again at Rowdy Creek Road and Highway 101. We've been successful in getting both the projects, which would involve turn lanes to get out of the line of traffic um, off those sections of our highway and into safety along those roadways. Um, both those projects have now been programmed for 2006 and 2007, so I'm excited that all the work that we've done and the heavy lifting is going to result in something that's going to save lives. Appreciate everybody's efforts on that, in particular Supervisor Borges and Supervisor Short for helping on the Transportation Commission and getting those pieces moving. Um, as Supervisor Starkey mentioned, I'm participating on the other piece of the Redwood Rise, and it's called Working Lands uh, Sector. Um, as part of the working land sector, we really help find ways to build the economy in what remains of our working lands here in Del Norte and the remaining regions, which Supervisor Starkey mentioned were Humboldt and Lake and Mendocino counties. One project I'm very excited on, which was submitted for application, is a, is a Hmong community project, which has to do with a slaughter operation. As some folks are aware, in 2010, the Tri-Agency Economic Development Authority went through a process with USDA to identify and conduct a feasibility study that produced a report that said something in our region of this scale was absolutely 100% needed. Um, nothing was done with that report to this date, and it basically collected, like most things, dust on a shelf. Um, the Hmong have taken this to heart, especially with their cultural background in slaughter and in processing and really have a headstrong game in making a proposal through this application process to raise dollars to do a facility here in Del Norte. And I'm really excited to help see this thing get funded and more importantly move forward. So as part of that working lands group, um, I'm going to do everything I can with the voting body to make sure it happens. Um, Supervisor Short was able to arrange several meetings uh, we've discussed in the past with concerns and support for legislation as it, re, uh, as it relates around AB uh, 951, Senator Wiener's bill, which uh, puts some limitations essentially around the Coastal Act and allows us to do some additional work around housing, which is desperately needed in many areas that were in the coastal zone. Um, Supervisor Short was able to get a meeting together with uh, Supervisor Gibson, who's currently the president of the California State Association of Counties, and we will be agendizing next week at the county's uh, CSAC Legislative Conference in Sacramento this item for the Coastal Counties Caucus. I'm looking forward to having this discussion, more importantly, seeing if the rest of the counties that are in the coast that are having the same housing issues that we are will back Senator Wiener's proposals and see if we can't get an additional look at this legislation that I think will be a game changer for housing in the coastal region. Um, we also attended with Supervisor Short a meeting at the Border Coast Regional Airport Authority. In particular, uh, part of the discussion was, um, was around uh, potentially a, um, a title change for an employee at the Border Coast Regional Airport Authority from a fiscal manager essentially to a deputy director. Um, this uh, report that was given by the Border Coast Regional Airport Authority director wasn't necessarily um, accurate at the time and we called a considerable amount of attention to it and ended up tabling the item so we could pull this discussion back to the board at a later date to discuss not only budgetary constraints within the Border Coast Regional Airport Authority, but the importance of creating a new position when there's not a whole lot of money to do so within that authority. 
And then lastly, I'd like to end uh, with two items as it relates to the festivities this week around the Kamome Festival. Um, I'm hoping every employee in the county that is able to attend a welcoming ceremony at the um, airport terminal Thursday at 4 o'clock for the nine-member delegation that will be arriving here from Riku Zentakata, Japan, uh, could attend. I think it's going to be one amazing event surrounding the remembrance of the boat's arrival here in 2013, but more importantly, what our children have essentially allowed us to do through returning that boat to Rikazen Taka, Japan and creating such a story of hope that not only generated an incredible amount of attention here in the United States, but around the world. Um, in following up on some of those activities, I'm looking forward to and have not discussed yet with Supervisor Starkey, um, getting a hold of her with some activities that we could do around the United States and Japan's announcement this year of um, increased tourism between both countries. I had a meeting just yesterday late with the U.S. Commercial Service and the top um, foreign affairs and tourism agencies within the U.S. Commercial Service on ways we could leverage this relationship into visitation here in our community. Um, as Supervisor Starkey serves on the Chamber of Commerce and Visitors Bureau Board, I think it's a natural fit for her to help gain those attentions and help move these pieces forward with the help and support of the U.S. Commercial Service. And that's the end of my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Supervisor Short. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, since our last meeting, I listened in on our RCRC legislative call-in session. Um, it's it's kind of overwhelming how much uh, legislation is coming down the uh, the pipe, and I'm thankful that RCRC is keeping us up on on those items that are concerning. Uh, participated in a Zoom meeting with Supervisor Howard and San Luis Obispo Supervisor Gibson. Um, won't belabor that, but there there is two pieces of legislation out there. Senator Blake Spear is also. Um, submitted a piece of legislation having to do with uh, high density housing in the coastal zones. So we're hoping to uh, support both of those and uh, keep an eye on those. Um, participated in a meeting with uh, LAFCO. Uh, we reviewed a annexation and a sphere of influence uh, item for the Klamath Community Services District. And we also had some more discussion about how to support the Klamath Fire Protection District. Um, had a meeting of Donor Local Transportation Commission. Um, other than the, the items that uh, Supervisor Howard mentioned, we also were given a milestones report about all projects that are going on in the county. If you're interested in seeing uh, or knowing about the projects uh, or, or the progress of any of those projects, uh, let me know and I will forward that milestones report to you. Um, I met with Mayor Inscore and Ted War of the uh, Solid Waste Management Authority to talk about personnel issues at the at the authority. Um, as Supervisor Howard said, we met, uh, we had a BACRA meeting and other than uh, the items that Supervisor Howard mentioned, we also uh, started the process of placing a land acknowledgement sign or a plaque at the airport building recognizing the Talawadani Nation. And finally, last night I attended a meeting of the Crescent Fire Protection District Board of Directors in hopes that I could make public comment and ask that they consider using Cooper Station for uh, to house search and rescue. I was unsuccessful. Uh, they will be pursuing the sale of the property and using the proceeds to construct a training facility. And that is my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Supervisor Borges. I'll save everybody the uh, the pain of listening to me because of the fact that uh, both both of the meetings I attended this last uh, were already talked about uh, during this uh, during this session. So we will shall move on to the next item, and that is uh, consent agenda. Do we have any public comment to be made about issues that are on the consent agenda? Seeing no public comment, bring it back to the board. I'll move we approve the consent calendar. We have a motion to approve. I'll or, second. And a second. Please pull the vote. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Supervisor Borges? Yes. Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Supervisor Short? Yes. Chair Wilson? Yes. Proclamation? Yes. 
And uh, we have one proclamation uh, that was just passed on consent and will be read by Supervisor Borges. Sexual Assault Awareness Month Proclamation, April 2024. Whereas sexual assault affects children, youth, adults, and elders of all genders from all racial, cultural, and economic backgrounds with public health and social justice implications for every person in Del Norte County, and whereas staff and volunteers of the North Coast Rape Crisis Team provide 24-hour service to survivors and their significant others and encourages every person to end sexualized violence by providing prevention, education, and awareness raising programs throughout Humboldt and Del Norte counties. And whereas no one person, organization, agency, or community can eliminate sexual assault on their own, but can, through collaboration and partnership, work together to support those impacted, improve responses, and ensure that survivors are not re-victimized. Now, therefore, we, the Del Norte County Board of Supervisors, reaffirms our commitment to the North Coast Rape Crisis Team and holding to our values of HEAL. Help meet survivors where they are at, empower them in their healing journeys, affirm their choices, and listen to their stories. And acknowledges April 2024 as Sexual Assault Awareness Month, passed and adopted on this ninth day of April 2024. Would you like to say some words? Please. Is this on? Okay. It is. Good morning. Thank you so much for your continued support of the North Coast Rape Crisis Team and Sexual Assault Awareness Month. This year has been huge for the Sexual Assault Response Team in Del Norte County. We have recruited and trained four new nurses, at, at three at Sutter Coast Hospital and one at Pelican Bay Prison, uh, to do exams here in Del Norte County. So survivors no longer have to go to Humboldt County in order to have evidence collected after they have been victimized. Um, we're honored to work with Supervisor Starkey with, around the domestic violence prevention and intervention issues here in Del Norte. Um, and all of that good work may be undone. We got news yesterday that the Federal Victims of Crime Act monies are going to be cut by 43%. Uh, and so that's a 43% cut to our budget as of October 1, um, and probably more to come. And so we are uh, grant writing like crazy, not sleeping, uh, and we are trying our best to get out of this, and we are committed to continuing our 24-hour free services to survivors, um, but we're in for a bumpy road, and so I just wanted to let you all know that, and also thank you for the grant that you gave us last year. We are so appreciative of that, of that funding, um, and it made a huge difference to survivors, so thank you so much. I'm thank you. here to answer any questions if you have any. I just want to say I appreciate your work. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the work you do. Thanks. Having those nurses trained is, 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 a, oh, huge. is a huge, huge improvement and, and much needed. Yes. Um, and it's, it, unfortunately, it's an ongoing process, it, you know, as we have turnover. But, but thank you so much for that. Absolutely. Thank you. We have a few minutes. We're going to take up number 14, and that is approve and adopt a tax resolution to appoint Jacqueline Roberts as County Council Range AA1 Step D, effective April 12, 2024, at request of the Board of Supervisors and presented by County Administrative Officer. Move, Move to, to approve. approve. <laughs> that, was, that was a dead tie, Kyle. <laughs> who, got, who gets it? <laughs> Supervisor Howard gets it. Okay. Seniority. That's right, seniority. Then okay. I'll second it. I'll go along with it. Any public comment? <laughs> yes. Thank you. I'm Chelsea Harbor. I just wanted to address that um, this um, whole how this is all played out. How now we new have a new county council, and um, I am very appreciative for Ms. Roberts to be willing to step into this role and to uptake this. I know that it wasn't the best of terms that the prior one had left, and I would also just encourage the board of supervisors to you know, reflect onto that whole situation, you know, the request for being able to have the approval earlier than later for that extension of the term and the ramifications.
implications of that. Now it's now been so many months since that situation and we are just now instilling our new county council. I think it's very imperative that we have this run a bit smoother for the future so that we don't have these months where we have a lapse in having our solid county council here to help represent our county. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Seeing none, bring it back oh, to the oh. Ryan Schillinger, um, just wanted to congratulate Jackie on her appointment and well, appreciate the board trusting her to do what's right for the county. Thank you. Any other public? All right, now we'll bring it back to the board for vote, please. Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Supervisor Short? Yes. Supervisor Borges? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Chair Wilson? Yes. Congrats, Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> you got the tiger now. Yeah. Thank you, board. <laughs> and that brings us to our timed item. It is a uh, time for a comment period. Members of the public may address the board on matters that are within the jurisdiction of the board. If you are addressing a board regarding a matter listed on the agenda, you may uh, be asked to hold your comments until the board takes up that matter. Please limit your comments to three minutes or less. Anyone, any public comment, please come forward at this time. I just like for you to think about something. <coughs> Excuse me. As we drive into Del Norte County, uh, going north on 101, there's these enormous billboards. And what do these billboards showcase? Rape, murder, sex, trafficking, suicide, as well as kidnapping. These signs paint a grim picture of our community. And as we continue northbound on 101, we are confronted with dilapidated buildings and economic blight. And let's not ignore, or don't even get me started, on the streets that are in grave disrepair. <sighs> Placing a cheerful sign like the one to Battery Point Lighthouse, the museum in Seaquake, amid such neglect adds insult to injury. You folks, you three folks who are re-elected, and emphasis on re-elected, this is the legacy of your leadership. This is the best you have provided for our community. Are you proud of this? Is there any hope for Del Norte County under your regime? Or will you continue to sit idly by, indulging in coffee, snacks, and complacency for another unhealthy four years for our community? We need to fix this, folks. It, it, it is disgusting. I was literally sick to my stomach going door to door campaigning. And Approaching houses where feces is on the doorstep and garbage piled high to the roof. Can't even tell where the front of the house is. And this is continuing throughout our county. There were very few places in 5th District, I must say, that were nice. And I'm literally sick of it. I've been here 34 years, and this is what, what we have become. And I don't see that it's ever going to get any better, not with this leadership, because you've already shown us what you can do. Nothing. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Okay. Seeing none. We will look at item number 15. This is a review and approve the draft action items as directed by the strategic planning team to compile these items along with the previously approved foundational elements into a final version of the 2024 Del Norte County Board of Supervisors organizational strategic plan to be presented and adoption in the, in the next meeting of the board recommended by the strategic planning team. Welcome. Good morning, board. Thank you. And I think we have a presentation uh, almost ready to go. 
Almost there. Okay, well, thank you, board. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be before you this morning. Um, if you recall the strategic plans of all the couple previous public uh, presentations, uh, this process actually began uh, late last year in December when the board gave direction to examine different options for how a strategic plan could be constructed. Um, I think the important point to bear in mind is that um, we do not have a strategic plan currently. Um, we have a number of kind of disparate uh, department level specific um, plans. And I think the direction from the board in December was fairly clear that there needed to be consensus over what an organizational strategic plan could look like. And certainly a desire to put to put actions together that would lead to positive outcomes for the, for the county, for the community, and certainly for the organization. So after the direction in December, um, in February, we kicked the process off. Um, we had hired a facilitator, uh, Don Ashton of Municipal Resources Group. We were very fortunate to, I think, um, get uh, connected with Mr. Ashton through our request for proposal for facilitator services, because really Mr. Uh, Ashton brought, a, I think, an outside perspective that was refreshing and certainly uh, very based in, in substantial experience and knowledge, um, having done this sort of thing himself professionally for a number of years and, and now uh, consulting and providing services like we had requested through the RFP. Um, so just with that preface kind of in mind, um, the, the framework that we use for the planning process um, after the foundational elements were established by the board um, previously really kind of was three, three levels. Uh, the one was the focus areas, which is kind of that big big picture perspective, identifying, you know, understanding the constraints that we're, we're operating under, um, what the focus of the plan should be, how to, how to be as efficient with our resources as we could be. Uh, the second frame within um, that framework is there our goals. And so what do we actually hope to achieve with respect to, to these broad kind of focus areas that we've identified? And then finally, to the point of not just having the plan sit on the shelf and collect dust, what sort of strategic actions can we take and within what time frame can we take those actions to actually hopefully address these goals? So um, just kind of laying that out again. Um, the focus areas uh, that we landed up landing on had to do with uh, county staffing and capacity under focus area one. Under focus area two, it was infrastructure and economic development. Under focus area three, law, justice, and homelessness. And under focus area four, general governance and budget. And so you, as a board, um, really entrusted the strategic planning team to come forward with actionable items to address these focus areas. Um, we did so as a team, which included um, our CIO, Mr. Lopez, uh, myself, Administrative Services Manager, uh, Tony Self, um, Clerk of the Board, slash Administrative Co uh, Services Coordinator, Kylie Gofter, and again, our, our consultant, uh, Mr. Ashton. Um, we didn't just do this in a silo. Um, we had the initial public workshop, uh, which was a special session of the board uh, with, with you all. Uh, we met individually with each one of you. Uh, we met with department leadership. Um, we initially, before we even formulated kind of the foundational elements, uh, we conducted, I think, a pretty comprehensive uh, poll, which um, asked a lot of questions that really, I think, through through the course of this conversation, you can kind of see where, where things were, were headed in terms of, again, identifying uh, some of the foundational elements that we were hoping the plan would accomplish, and also give us public perspective on strengths weaknesses, opportunities, and threats uh, for, for the county with the position the county's in. So that's, uh, after all that process, kind of where we landed in terms of the focus areas. Um, and now we can get into uh, these action items. There's going to be a lot to get through. Um, again, we don't currently have a strategic plan or an organizational plan. So there's a lot here. And I, I think um, it's been noted by you know everyone that we've spoken to from inside and outside. This is really ambitious, um, but again, I, I, it's I think as we we kind of framed it in December, it's time it's time to, to do this and, and do do this work. Um, we may not be able to achieve it all, but we need to at least have strategies put together for how we're going to address uh, these issues. So within the first focus area. Uh, county staffing and capacity. Um, the first goal was reducing the vacancy rates. Um, 
in response to the, the data that was collected and the information that we received and the conversations that we had, it really had to do with wages. It's, pre it's pretty simple, um, I think, for a lot of people. But to have a good understanding of what that means, you need to actually do, do some work. Um, so what we su are suggesting here is that we do a comp study, a compensation study, and we use this for, for future uh, management purposes when it comes to potentially addressing things like wages. Um, second, improving recruitment outcomes and expediting the hiring process. Again, th these are themes that we heard through the course of, of conversations and collecting data. Um, and, and the question is, how do, we, how do we do that? So through the action items here, uh, this, is, this is a fairly monumental uh, move organizationally. And that would be establishing a standalone human resources department. Uh, we don't currently have that. We have a human resources division without a director level uh, leader. So this would be establishing a, a dedicated uh, human resources department, which would likely include uh, some risk management uh, functions as well. Uh, some of these others, you know, you could argue they're just kind of part of, you know, what uh, we should be doing. And I would, I would agree with that. These are things we should be doing. Uh, but one uh, would be really implementing as part of our culture um, a job fair, having a county job fair where we're really constructively engaging with potential employees and being as, as welcoming as we can be in, uh, for applications in our organization. Things like setting up a terminal where they can maybe submit an application right then and there. Um, doing an interview potentially right then and there. I mean, I'm throwing ideas out there that we'll need to figure out as we do implementation of this, but again, it's kind of leveraging things that we are kind of to a certain degree already doing in the, in the form of a job fair in this case. Um, another idea would be uh, department specific or kind of mini uh, job fairs. Thirdly, um, under this goal, uh, would be adopting personnel rules. Again, we, this is something we don't currently have, and having personnel rules would kind of provide some structure to the process for, uh, for uh, recruitments. Um, reducing employee turnover and increasing retention. Things as simple as an employee appreciation program. Um, again, these are things that in the past the county has had uh, because of budgetary issues or pandemics or, or different factors that kind of ebb and flow. Uh, but the idea would be here that if we embed this into the strategic plan, it becomes part of our, our actions, part of what we do. Um, potentially a remote work policy. Uh, this one may be contentious for some, it may not even be available for some positions, but it was something that we did uh, here pretty frequently in the conversations that we had with, with current employees and, and leaders in terms of things that we can do to uh, improve our, uh, our turnover uh, situation. This could be a way to keep employees if certain positions can be uh, done remotely. Improving access to housing. Um, again, this is a theme that we heard uh, quite, quite a bit. Um, a couple of strategies uh, that we identified would be um, identifying surplus county land, which potentially could be marketed and turned into um, affordable housing, maybe even beyond just for county employees, but for other, other uh, folks within the community. Uh, Short-term vacation rental ordinances. We did here, and I think you hear pretty frequently in a lot of other uh, communities that short-term uh, vacation rentals do interface in a, in a negative way in terms of housing inventory within the area, even if it's just a little. So what that could look like would obviously need to be determined, but there's a lot of cities and counties that are doing this, so it could be something for the board uh, to consider. Um, and then lastly, within uh, this first focus area, uh, housing availability information. Just something as simple as, you know, getting data from the local real, real estate community and, and making that available to employees whenever they come to the counter to collect a job application, having a, a flyer that's updated, you know, if the board has issue with any of these actions, um, please speak up. This would be kind of the time to do that and to let us know and to give us direction. When I get to the end of looking at all these specific actions, you're gonna see kind of a timeline laid out, um, which I think Supervisor Howard, in a way, kind of requested during the last uh, presentation whenever we were talking about the foundational elements for how this is actually gonna work for implementation. So um, we, have, we have that kind of developed uh, for your awareness. And, and again, to reiterate, it's, it's a lot. It's gonna be a pretty heavy lift for the resources that we have, but uh, we feel like it's, it's a step in the right direction. Focus area two, uh, again, infrastructure and economic development. Maintaining or improving county facilities and infrastructure, supporting countywide economic development, improving the aesthetics of county-owned properties and facilities. So within these goals, things like formulating a capital improvement planning team approach, uh, developing a holistic or comprehensive capital improvement plan, 
Uh, we know that we have the GL Rehabilitation Project uh, that's going to need to be budgeted for in 24 or 25. Uh, the search and rescue relocation, which is already noted uh, this morning by Supervisor Short, um, potentially adding economic development services to within the county. We don't currently have an economic development uh, department or division or, or service within the county. Um, we are in the process of implementing broadband uh, network design improvements through a local agency technical assistance grant that was provided by the California Public Utilities Commission. It's a pretty exciting project um, and it could potentially expand uh, broadband beyond what we already have, uh, which would be a really good thing from a, an infrastructure and economic development perspective. Um, we have some funding currently in the works uh, for a couple different projects at county parks. And county parks, um, in a way, are kind of an underutilized county asset in, in the sense of economic development and the, and the purpose that it serves for visitor serving uses within the community. Uh, we have three beautiful parks, uh, one in the Redwoods, one in the, on the river, one right on the beach. So. Uh, using uh, our budgeted funds to make those improvements and to potentially uh, better leverage those opportunities would certainly be a good thing. Um, we are currently using uh, uh, budgeted Measure R funds for public improvements adjacent to the, the Sheriff's Office and the Courthouse and at the Veterans Memorial Hall. These are some pretty um, heavily used public uh, buildings that we're hoping to see some real tangible improvements from using Measure R uh, funding. County property cleanup and improvements. Um, again, you know we have uh, quite a bit of property under the county's ownership, and we need to be we need to be good um, landlords, good owners of that property. And part of it would be making sure that it's it's kept uh, clean and aesthetically attractive to folks, so we present a, a, a positive image to the community and, and visitors to the to the community. And then lastly, under this uh, focus area, we have Pike. Pike Rehabilitation Project. Supervisor Starkey noted uh, we, did, we did receive um, an approval of an earmark request. Thank you, Congressman Huffman, sincerely um, for assisting with securing that funding, and we will definitely put it to good use. Um, and we'll have more details to come on that as, as we better formulate uh, the, the plans for the use of those funds. Under focus area three, again, lodge justice and homelessness. Um, again, some of these items already noted uh, by the board, even, the, even this morning. Uh, one would be the previous board direction of hiring a public defender under the managed assigned council structure. Uh, that is very much in process, and we hope to uh, have some resolution on that uh, as soon as we can. Proactively and collaboratively addressing community homelessness. Um, again, this is funding that's come into the county, in this case, to the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, as the board's very well aware, and I think most of the public, is a little over $10 million for the encampment resolution funding. That project is underway uh, for the Williams Drive property and some kind of related services. Um, another idea that we had under this, uh, kind of in recognition that the issue of homelessness isn't a temporary or short term problem. It seems to be here to stay. And so having an ad hoc committee, which is really a temporary body of the board, doesn't really make a lot of sense. They really ought to be uh, established as a standing technical advisory committee, along with our other technical advisory committees. And then lastly, in a way kind of related to the earth uh, funding is the acquisition and cleanup of the encampment properties, uh, which has kind of been underway and hits, you know, fits and starts. And hopefully we can get uh, that project completed and, and, and that land uh, turned over to land managers that can, that can take care of it longer term. And then lastly, another project uh, which has been uh, discussed with the board. This would be probations, uh, Prop 64 funding for the transition of the juvenile hall into a youth opportunity center and just being as supportive as we can be as a community and as, as a board and as staff to, uh, to that transition. And then lastly, a lot on this one, <laughs> uh, the general governance and budget. Um, a lot of these actions really, again, relate to organizational initiatives and interests of the board um, as administered principally through your administration department. Um, a number of these projects do kind of interface with other departments, but really administration generally is the lead on, on most of these. And I think that's certainly true in focus area four. Um, maintaining core service levels. We, um, 
back in December again through the initial conversations that had to do with strategic planning were connected with Nevada County as kind of a, a non-urban county, a, more of a suburban and rural county uh, that had done really good work in the strate strategic planning uh, space. And one of the things that they emphasized that you can't do anything else without providing your core services first. And so the order of, of all this is a little bit arbitrary, um, but I would just want to point, put emphasis on maintaining core services and statutorily required services certainly has to be, you know, precedence over, over everything else. Part of that would be obviously adopting a uh, balanced budget and providing mandated programs. Um, we've included updating the master fee schedule, which is very outdated and does need to be updated um, under the core services. Um, part of this through conversations with the sheriff um, would also be examining the feasibility of something like the animal shelter, which has a pretty dramatic uh, drain on the county's general fund and whether there could be potentially another uh, avenue to explore to accommodate the operation of the, of the facility. Not to say there wouldn't be a cost um, with having a non-governmental organization or an NGO uh, potentially take that operation over, but it could be a, a step in the right direction for the, for the county. Uh, fiscal responsibility. Um, at the last meeting, the board took the very um, wise move of adopting a pension management policy, and this would be kind of similar to that. It would have to do with uh, other post-employment benefits or OPEB benefits, and having a management policy in place uh, would, be, would again just be a fiscally prudent uh, measure for the board to consider, so we've included that in our recommendations. Um, we know that uh, there's a ballot initiative in November that has to do with minimum wage in California, that the consequences of that on our pay uh, structure could be pretty, pretty significant. And so trying to get in front of that issue through um, doing some analysis on what it could mean for our, our staffing charts, our salary schedules, because of compaction and movement and upward kind of push uh, from minimum wage, uh, that'd be important for us to do. Um, this next item is one that we've noted several times uh, in previous conversations as, a, as another fairly heavy lift. Um, and that's going to be the transitioning of the county's uh, basically um, financial system uh, from an in-house system that includes a whole bunch of different pieces that have kind of been developed over many years, decades even, um, into a more modern enterprise resource uh, planning platform or ER ERP. Uh, we've uh, We've decided to contract with a vendor, uh, Tyler Technologies, and so that's going to be a fairly heavy, uh, extremely heavy lift uh, for the auditor and for IT in particular, uh, but a number of other county departments as well to get us uh, on board with a new ERP system. Improving oversight of county programs and services. Um, Assessing the organizational structure of, of the county, how the departments are structured, what services we provide, how that aligns with the strategic plan. Um, this is a recommendation of, of the, the strategic planning team. Um, there's a number of services, and I noted economic development already, just as an example that we do not currently provide to the community through our organization. Uh, that's an example of something that we potentially could. Um, and there's, there's a bunch of other examples too. But basically starting with, you know, where we are now, what our gaps are, and how do we, how do we bridge those gaps um, if, if we need to at all. Um, assessing the joint powers authorities that the county is part of. Um, there's a number of JPAs that the county is part of. Um, they all serve purposes, and they all kind of exist under uh, JPAs, which you'll be talking about one here in a few, in a few minutes. Um, that are outdated, perhaps in some ways, or maybe not as applicable as they were at a certain point in time. So just examining the kind of the efficacy and the structure of those JPAs and whether the county's uh, kind of partnership with the other JPA members is as equitable as perhaps it, it should be. It's a bigger conversation, but kind of looking principally at the, at the JPAs themselves um, over the course of the next couple of years and to figure out you know where the, where the board wants to be with those. Um, assessing uh, physical spaces and locations and, and needs of county departments. We have a number of county departments um, that are bursting at the seams and the spaces that they're in now. And so having conversations with those departments about how their, their service can be, be better provided, uh, maybe with some modification of their space or a change of their location or, or whatever, it's, it's a... a it's time to do that, certainly with, with uh, at least a handful of departments and potentially others. Um, 
MMB and BOE training. So this would be specific for the board um, with bargaining coming up with a couple of the groups and having just concluded with the one um, MMB training is as the ultimate policy makers for the county would certainly be a, a prudent thing for the county to invest in. So we've, we've recommended that be included and also included uh, board of equalization training uh, because this is something that seems to be happening with a higher degree of frequency. The assessors appeals come forward and the board has to change their hats from the supervisors into the board of equalization. And so just giving you guys the, the proper tools uh, to be able to do that. Um, and then cleaning up the county code. This is um, definitely one that is just like a lot of things long overdue. Um, there are sections in the county code that are completely irrelevant to our current environment. And so just taking a real honest accounting for the county code and making whatever um, changes need to be made um, specifically to the county code would be something that we've included, uh, maybe not as a, as a pressing issue, but something that we want to include on the list because it is um, ultimately the county's laws. So having those reflect what they should is important. Um, and then lastly, um, we've spoken about this before, it's just how do we embed this sort of planning into our, into our process. Um, one way to do it would be just like we did with the budget process to actually uh, memorialize it in the county's administrative policies. And so having um, a basic framework for how the strategic plan would be reviewed, updated, um, adjusted uh, could be fairly uh, easily probably added to the administrative manual, uh, just like with the budget team where the steps were clearly lined out. Um, and then updating the board template. Some of these things are, are pretty simple, uh, but updating the board uh, report template so that actions that are taken by you all as the, again, the policy makers and the decision makers of the county can clearly tie to the strategy that you've adopted. Um, it'd be an easy, easy thing to, to have and change in terms of the template, uh, but it would kind of tie all those pieces together for your, your decision making. Um, and then lastly, uh, again, spoken about this one before previously as well, um, once these actions are approved based on the previous approvals that the board has, has made with the foundational elements, including the, the mission, the vision, the values, the focus areas, the goals, um, compiling that into, again, using the Nevada County model of a clear plan, um, which is gonna look very different than this. It's gonna look you know, substantially more polished and you'll be able to see kind of progress as it's made on, the, on each of these initiatives. Uh, having that completed, which we should be able to do after receiving board direction today at the next meeting and have that available for, for public uh, review and, and board uh, input. Uh, basically taking all this uh, information, co collating it into, into that final plan and presenting it to the board for approval. So again, as I mentioned, there was a lot to get through. Um, love to receive any feedback or thoughts uh, that you or the public may have on, on any of these items. Uh, just to reiterate, we do recognize we're taking on a lot, um, yeah, but we're okay with that. We think it's, we think it's time and um, we don't think that these are, are not, not achievable. We think we can do it. So these, this is a summary kind of in terms of the timeline, maybe hard to see for the, for the public, uh, but it is available on, on the website um, in terms of how we've laid it out. The red, uh, Cells would be what we're kind of prioritizing actually leading into the, the formal adoption of the plan, which would be on July 1st or quarter one of fiscal year 24, 25. So the red uh, cells again would be leading into that. That would be essentially the fourth quarter of this current fiscal year. The orange cells would be fiscal year 24, 25, uh, quarter one, Q2, Q3, and Q4. And then the yellow and the green would be the two uh, subsequent fiscal years. And then the blue would, would be pieces that would probably extend um, indefinitely. Um, things like um, uh, the ERF uh, project is something that's gonna be in place probably for a while. Um, and uh, there was one other that I can not quite make out from here, but I think you get the point. Um, if there's any questions, I'm certainly available. And again, we'd love to get your feedback on this. Also, I should mention uh, Mr. Ashton, our facilitator is also on the line. So if you guys have any questions for him, uh, any perspective and, and on may even want to jump on and, and share a few of his thoughts, uh, but he's available today as well. Thank you. Does Mr. Ashton have anything he wants to add? Is he still on? 
It might just take a minute for him. I don't have Zoom up, so it might just take a minute for him to connect. I'm not sure. I can, I can hear you. you. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chair. The only thing I'll add is when you should, should be very proud, proud of, your of your staff or or the efforts they did in this. this. The first, first year, in each of the plan, plan. Uh, that's, that's when I was there. there. A few yeah, weeks ago, it was always the hardest. Um, many times, times, the first strategic plan, plan is very tactical, tactical in nature. I think your team did a great job of having some tactical tasks to be done. Um, examples of that are the, excuse me, are the county code updates and the fee study updates. Those are something jurisdictions struggle with all the time. But you have a lot of strategic long-term initiatives in there as well. So I thought uh, the team struck a, a very nice balance. And now it's hopefully the board will approve it. And then your team can get to work and implementing everything. I'm happy to answer any questions, but nothing further at this time. Thank you. Any questions from the board? So I have just a thank you uh, to the, all the staff for, for putting this together. This is a lot of work and a lot of thought went into it. Um, I guess my overarching question will be when each of these things are going to come forward and be uh, uh, implemented, will it come back to the board and will we have individual discussions or if we prove this today, are we kind of saying you've got our blessing, you can go forward with developing and implementing uh, comprehensive personal policy rules. I mean, that's what I'm, I guess I'm trying to find out. So that's a great question. So the direction that you're providing with the approval of the plan is just that, it's direction. So once the board says, go do this, we'll go do it. But then if it's something that rises to the level of needing to have board approval, like what the, the example you gave, that would certainly come back to the board. Um, there might even need to be a, a review by council for, you know, legal, uh, you know, uh, perfection before we before it's approved by the board. So it depends on, I think, the specific item, but, but certainly the larger items and the, and the one you mentioned, personal policies and county code, you know, those are ordinances in the case of county code uh, that would need to be actually approved by the board. Okay, thank you. Um, because one of the items is the to send it out for a compens uh, compensation analysis. And don't we have one recently from the collective good? Isn't that something that, I mean, why are we, to send this out again, when we've already spent an enormous amount of money in 2021, um, are we going to be sending this out again? And are we approving that today that we're saying, yes, you can go ahead and do that again? It'll, it'll come back before the board before it's done, but yes, we would be doing a new comp study. And we don't have a, uh, I would say, an extreme amount of confidence because of the changing you know, economic landscape, even the last couple of years, uh, the recovery from the pandemic and our, our you know, certainly our location is a, is a factor. Um, I think there's a number of things in, in the existing comp study that we would definitely want to have uh, at a minimum revalidated, if not entirely uh, reestablished because of the time between even then and now, even though it might seem like a short amount of time ago, there's, there's a number of factors. You know, and again, I could give tons of examples of inflation and things yeah, like I, that, that that need to be revalidated. Yeah, my, my only concern though is is that so this new comp analysis comes back and it's 10 times as much as the, the initial one that was in 2021. Are we going to then be encouraged to follow that comp analysis? How is that gonna work for us? How is that, you know, going to come and play out right. for us? Well, I mean, uh, the, the, the purpose of the comp study is you know, largely a management tool. Um, and whenever negotiations happen and, and, and uh, you know, compensation is, is considered, you know, nothing is decided until it's mutually agreed to and approved ultimately by you, the board. So we just see this as, as one more tool to have available if you're going to be doing that. You certainly want to have the best information possible. So while there would be a cost in having the, a, a new comp study done, it could really pay dividends in terms of those negotiations and then the options that you're ultimately presented with. So I would just view it as, as a, another tool to have at your disposal. Okay. And then, you know, I've got to make my once a year pitch um, is that I want open budget hearings. And I think in reviewing some of the, the um, responses from the public as well as the county employees, that was brought up a number of times. Is there a reason why open budget hearings and that sort of thing was not included in this uh, general government's governance and budget? I don't think that there's a particular uh, form that that 
you know, needs to take. It could include really anything the board directs. Um, fundamentally, the, the mandate, I think, on staff is, is presenting a balanced uh, budget that provides those core services. And so if the board collectively decides, you know, we want, it, we want the vehicle to look differently for us to get there, again, that's your board prerogative. Um, you know, why it wasn't included in the plan, I think we were more focused on what we were providing, which was a balanced uh, budget. Okay. All right, I, I just want to make my pitch, my once sure. a year pitch. I, I really do believe that we need to have open budget hearings where the community is engaged with what it is that we're, we're allocating the money to and they can have some input on it. And then the board itself can have some input to hear directly from the department heads because a lot of times we don't hear from the department heads. They get to go to the budget team. The budget team then decides what the board is able to see and hear. So it's my once a year pitch and I'll leave it at that. Noted. Any, any other comments from the board? Anyway, I, I appreciate all the work and the effort that, that uh, has gone into this uh, for staff and, and for uh, the personnel. I know it was a, a grueling days that you put into, into ahead of this, plus all the uh, simulation of all the, of all the polls that you, that you took in. Um, but I like to see it, it, that what is reflected in what you presented today are hitting those core issues that we all had concerns about and had brought forward. And so they were definitely put down. Um, it is a heavy lift. I know this, uh, and I appreciate the fact that, that we're taking this endeavor at this time and trying to expedite that we have some actionable items to take this budgetary year. And I know that's, that's been kind of the focus really pushing forward, but understand that this is not just a one-off and nor is it something that sits on the shelf. And so, I look forward to the next and uh, final presentation that you'll be making uh, to us. I think the public needs to get involved uh, so that we have that interchange, but also that, um, you know, that like every, every other daunting task, you know, we, you know, you don't eat elephant all at once. You take small bites and that's, that's really where we're trying to go and, and get this effectively done. And I appreciate the work and I, and then bring it back to the board for, and, or any public comments, sorry. First off, uh, thank you for your work. I appreciate it. So what I'm about to say, please don't take this personal. <laughs> okay. Is this like a 20 year plan or is this supposed to be a one year plan? That's what I want. Oh, so. Because I, I, I think this is a little bit too much. Let me tell you. First off, in regards to employee retention, and don't take this personal, Mr. Lopez, but, you know, uh, it, it's, the rumor is, is that Mr. Lopez is so tight with his money and, and paying his employees that it takes a sledgehammer to uh, shove a, uh, mustard seed up his bottom. So we got to change that somehow. These employees need to be paid and now keep your employees. The, uh, the strategic plan, in my opinion, it, it's too vast. And you guys need to, I don't know, it needs to be a little bit tighter and we need to see things that we can do and it can be noticeably, noticeably uh, in in public, like with cleanliness, we don't, I don't see. I don't know. I could be wrong, but are there ordinances for keeping up, maintaining your lawns and your and the garbage in front of your house and burned up houses that just seem to be left there and nobody comes in and and that uh, cleans that up? I mean, come on now. We need to clean up our town in our county. It's disgusting. It doesn't send a good message. We have beautiful redwoods in, in an ocean here. And it's disgusting how people live. I know you can't change a person, but you can put laws on the books now I'm from the state of Missouri. I was born there. You go to Missouri and uh, if you don't mow your lawn every week, you get a citation. Groomed lawns, 
the roads are impeccable. But, and we live in one of the most pristine and most beautiful places in the United States, and nobody seems to give a damn about keeping it clean. You can be poor and keep things clean. You, you guys, shorten up your list. Do something that you can do effectively. Norma Williams, Chapter President, Delaware County Employees Association, SIU 1021. I reviewed this over the weekend. Had to review it several times. Um, good work, well in meaning, well intended, I'm sure. I'm sure a lot of employees appreciate some of what's actually listed here. However, a couple of red flags that the union has already seen here. One, yeah, a database for housing is appreciated, I'm sure. However, what you may deem affordable, what property managers and rental, rental lords and owners may deem affordable may not be what's affordable to county employees based on what we currently make. But a database would be nice. Um, however, if you look at Facebook, you'll see some people going, making a lot of comments about what's being charged out there in terms of, of uh, housing and rental. That's one. Um, number two, obviously another compensation analysis. Seriously, we spent $157,000 on one a couple of years ago. Nothing ever came of that. The only time we ever did anything on a compensation analysis study was back in the late 1900s, 1990s, sorry, 1999, oh God, what was it, 1999, 98, somewhere around there? In 2000 is when we began to implement it. That was the only time we did that. We did one ag again in around 2008, 2009, nada. We did one back in 2016, nada. We did one again in 2021, nada. You're gonna do another one? Seriously, and how much is that gonna set you back? You see, you say it's for management purposes. Well, I can guarantee you that the union and I would assume the other employee groups would wanna see that as well. Especially since it does impact the county employees who we represent. And since we are going to be in the midst of bargaining this year, yeah, we would definitely want to see that because that will definitely impact negotiations and proposals from both sides. When you're looking at, oh, let's see here. One big red flag for me was the operate, uh, con the feasibility of contracting the operation of the county animal shelter to a non-governmental organization. Keep in mind that we represent animal control staff. Anything that happens to that organization impacts staff, you'll have to discuss it with the union. In terms of perks and incentives, that won't pay an employee's bills. It won't pay bills. Discounts are nice, thank you. Recognizing our our, uh, our, our service here is wonderful. Health and Human Services does that already. Maybe you might take a look and see what they do. But perks and incentives, discounts, seriously? Like I said, there's a couple of red flags here. I'm sure when I see the final one, I'll hopefully have more time to speak. But again, you're gonna need to speak with us. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Robert. I was just surprised to see all the, the anticipated Prop 64 funding. You know, um, I had been working, Supervisor Starkey, I think, tried to pitch to get it on the agenda to collect cannabis taxes to, to give to youth sports at the rec center. And Dean Wilson wouldn't have it, but his brother-in-law owns a pot shop, as I keep bringing up. And he votes to set my tax rate in favor of his brother. And so he threw away a whole bunch of money. It was a ton of money for me. 
you know, for the government, as they'll point out, it's not very much money. And they got $3.2 million last year, and they're planning on getting more Prop 64 money that's based off of you having an ordinance that allows somebody to operate, not that where somebody gets penalized on their taxes because of what they say. I remember speaking about the golf simulator, and I remember that day saying, I'm never going to get my tax lowered if I bitch about the golf simulator today. It's just bullshit, though. It's frankly bullshit, you know, to have a boss hog group up here. You know, you're putting ethics in your little strategic plan, but you don't know what ethics and values are. You don't even know what you're about to approve money to out of our general fund for, for, for filmmaking, but you won't take my money for free because I want it to go to a youth group. Your local money from your local business owner that locally raises his children here. I think it's fucking bullshit, and the only way to articulate it is to call it like it is. You guys should be better with your money, and you shouldn't have voted for Dean to be your chairperson. He has no ethics. He has no values. He's here to prove a point. And where was the survey results? And where was the results of the, uh, the public hearing we had where, what, five people showed up to talk? about the strategic plan? Um, I just think it's, I think it's baloney that you guys are, are counting on Prop 64 funds. How much money are you counting on next year? From what? You know, I would call it like a leech. I guess you guys are living off the teat of the people, right? You know, I think it's horrible. You know, you guys want uh, vacant buildings? I rent one there. You guys have no interest in having me do business? Isn't economic development part of your plan? You guys have a cannabis committee. The Darren Short said there was no reason to initiate. When you guys talk about taxes each year, that's every year you guys should use your cannabis committee. Otherwise, what is it for? Um, give me a break. And you guys want Prop 64 money. I think that I think that your position is above you, Dean, and I think you're far below it. Thank you. Appreciate your oh, you. Oh, you're best. Yeah, I yeah. Think it was no problem. Hello, Chelsea Harbor again. Um, I again, I also want to overlay my sentiments for that I am glad that we have this going on. I think it's really imperative for our county to have a strategic planning team and for something to be going in this regard. You know, just any forward progress is great, but we it does, it is very high level overview, I understand at this point, and there's a lot more to go down into. Um, one, a couple questions that I would have is that I, maybe I missed it, but I didn't see anything in there regarding um, our library or you know our resources for our youth besides the possible youth center or um some of that i believe but i would like really you know the future of our county is our youth and so much of our youth is getting swayed by the drugs and by you know so much of this that is going on in our county and we're just seeing it more and more and more we're hearing all kinds of reports students dropping out students you know overdosing going through all of this we do not have enough youth resources in our county for our youth it's, they are our future there are so many people in this county that they leave as soon as they can to get out of here and they either don't come back or they do with a chip on their shoulder and that they feel the same way that there is not enough programs here for our youth our library is falling apart it is in the worst condition possible I personally I have kids they absolutely love going to the library I hate going to the library I hate it it stinks it's dirty it's gross there's homeless all around it I feel very unsafe for me and my family every single time we go to the library and we're going in I have to have them right next to me being aware and conscious of all of the homeless and everything around it I think our library needs to be a huge focus moving forward on being able to provide a new location 
improve the offerings that they have in the programs. We have some great people that work at the library, but their hands are tied with what they can do and with the money and the resources that they have. Having some kind of youth facility and library, something combined, a YMCA, I know we, there's been different things in the past. We really need to focus on how we can support and lift up and encourage our youth and guide them to the bigger and better things in our world rather than what they're just succumb to because there isn't other things out there. So they go with their friends into the woods. I would really like to see that change and for that to be implemented and for that to be in the red cell section to be taken on immediately. Thank you. Thank you. Morning board. My name is Dave Powell. Thanks for the opportunity to to talk to you. Uh, I, for one, am very thankful that we have Randy uh, on our side. That's a, a huge, just creating that, that presentation is a huge effort, let alone doing the work behind it. Uh, it did help me to see the uh, timeline because this is a, an onerous task. This is a huge thing, but it does have to be done. I agree. Uh, but it's nice having it spread out over the next few, few years. That's a good thing. Uh, obviously, for me, when my ears kind of stick up when I hear talk about uh, short-term rentals. And uh, I really am uh, not opposed to having an ordinance dealing with short-term rentals, as long as it's in a positive note and keeps in mind the property owner's rights. Um, I, you know, the wild, wild west is not good for anybody. I think having a pattern and having uh, controls are not a bad thing, uh, you know. And then as far as, uh, Pikes Field, you guys probably know, but we are starting just this week, uh, the Little League is starting a program with over 500 kids that are using Pikes Field for the next two or three months. And uh, it's a great resource in our county, and I uh, encourage you to really support all that efforts too. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Seeing none, bring it back to the board. Mr. Chairman, I move we approve uh, the draft action items and direct strategic planning team to compile these items along with the previously approved foundational elements into the final version of the 2024 Delaware County Board of Supervisors organizational strategic plan. I'll second. We have a motion to second. Any comment? Yes. Um, I kind of held my comments, but Supervisor Short rushed into it, so that's okay. We got a motion and a second on the table. I want to express some of my reservations and, and bring up a point that Supervisor Starkey made. I think we're moving a little too fast here. Um, there's a lot on this piece of paper, and I have some of the same concerns the public expressed. There's a, a lot on this paper. We, we really need to think hard about getting focused on what is achievable and what is not. And in addition, um, really understand in a period that is longer than the 20 minute presentation we had, what each of these things mean. I thought the questions that Supervisor Starkey asked specifically on will this come back to us, I think is an important question to ask. Um, I for one don't wanna start setting policy and direction until we fully understand what policy and direction we're setting. And right now I don't know really a lot of these pieces, I understand some, but others I don't. And there's a lot in here as it relates to economic development. I question whether or not it has anything to do with economic development, yet they're listed under an economic development category. In addition, there's a lot in there that has to do with JPAs, one of which we're gonna discuss today. And yet, there's some direction in here outside of this specific piece on JPAs and looking at other ways to do some of that work. And then I think about how that all relates to cash flow and our general fund, of which we don't have much of that to implement what could come out as policy direction from this strategic plan. And so I am extremely concerned about taking large leaps without fully understanding what this document means to our staff that has limited time and limited resources. But I, I hesitate strongly to make moves until we really understand where that cash is gonna be coming from. And um, I agree 100% with 
with Mr. Powell because that could be literally one of the only pieces that we even see growth in our general fund budget here, period. I don't see any other growth coming because some of the economic development pieces that could be potential future items for Del Norte County aren't happening. They're just not. We gotta think about where our cash flow is and there's very limited cash flow that comes in from vacation resources but we also have to think about opening some doors. Property taxes are what generates some of that fund. Gas tax is what generates some of that fund. Sales tax is what generates some of those funds that all make up our general fund. And so I do have a lot of concerns in here about specific items, and yet we're being asked to consider this potentially at one of our next meetings and finalizing it. And I just wanted to express those concerns today and I, I know the board's ready to move on to a strategic plan. I understand that, but I also think we should have some further discussion on this and really think about peeling back to those items that could potentially, we could put rubber to the road and, and show some accomplishments without one or two people trying to drive a huge network of things that are gonna change the look in our future. So that's what I wanted to state before that motion went forward. Chair, if I could, given uh, Supervisor Howard's comments, I, I would like to withdraw my second. Okay. Well, with that, with that comment, I'm actually kind of the opposite. Um, I really appreciate all the effort that uh, Randy put in and the aggressive timeline. And, you know, one of my biggest complaints of sitting up here is everything takes forever. Everything takes so long to get anything done. And so the fact that there's, you know, earmarks and timelines and let's get this thing going and start making things happen in this community, I think it's great. Um, I do, you know, I think we should be heavily involved if there's any big decisions to be made, which I think it is clearly stated that we would be. So um, with that being said, I am I'm, I'm in favor of moving forward and I will make that second to approve this. Yeah, thank you, Supervisor Borges. I understood it the same way. Um, we talked about that big picture and uh, forming goals and then bringing down into action items. I, uh, I understood that as us being uh, involved in that process as well. And right from the very beginning, we did talk about a pretty ambitious timeline um, and, and recognizing that that is gonna be a uh, onerous task. So uh, appreciate your support in that, Supervisor Borges. And, and again, at this point in time, all we're doing is we're approving the, the action points that you have that you've laid out and the, and again they are very ambitious absolutely but they are all things that we need to be addressing and dealing with and so they're critical for us in our planning stage and moving forward this is setting nothing in cement at this point in time other than those are the action items that you're going to be focusing on and you'll be coming back to us as these things flesh out and you're gonna be trying to make a presentation in the next, on how these things would be moving forward. And so at this point, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to see what you've tailored out, and I'm far more interested to see how that next progression step and what details you put onto the bones that you've set before us today. Uh, and, and the devil's in the details, and that's what is coming, not what is here. And, but I do appreciate the fact that Yes, the outline that you presented us on the things that you have, uh, that this process has identified as critical as we move forward. I, I agree with, you know, in concept of, of all these things. Now, what comes forward to us and the board is the details. And that will be where we're gonna have, you know, far more robust discussions because that's where direction is going to be really showing us how we want to proceed going forward, not where we are. This is just giving us the lens to look through. It is not giving us the course. And I appreciate that. I guess I just asked the board the question uh, very clearly is, are there any of these items on the spreadsheet that you're not in agreement with being in the strategic plan?
I, I can answer that there are several that I would want to have more of a role in the decision making process when it, when the rubber meets the road. Um, so I think that, you know this is too big of a broad of an overview. And one thing I also think is lacking, and perhaps it can be in the final plan, is how the board is going to be involved, in which steps the board it would have to come back before the board, so that we have some sort of um, input because some of these things are, are very big and they're gonna change a lot and I don't necessarily think that um, it should just happen without the board weighing in. So perhaps that next step uh, for staff before you bring it back for the final can include where the board's involvement is going to be so that we feel comfortable knowing that, you know, maintaining county property might not be one that the board is involved in but actually restructuring how the cao and the ceo work we would be involved in does that make sense and is the board agreeing to something like that it's my take on this is is where the board wants to go we go it's our decision on how much or how little our input and direction is given and so nothing that, that was presented today limits the board in any, in any avenue other than we are giving them direction on these focus points. If you want something stricken at this point in time, you could probably strike it at this point in time with consensus if that's the issue that we need going forward. Yes, please. So just listening to the conversation, I think it's a good conversation. And I think to take um, the idea of Supervisor Starkey and just make it clear that some of these elements will actually require subsequent board approval would be easy to, for us as staff to include in the plan. Um, if you noticed in the board report, one of the things that we identified on each of the actions was who the responsible department would be. And that would be more to do with the implementation of whatever the action was. We could very easily add to each one of these items a yes or no on whether it requires board approval. There's obvious things, like I noted earlier, the ordinances that would have to come back and be approved by the board. Anything to do with short-term rental uh, would have to be reconsidered by the board. Other things like posting a flyer in HR for housing wouldn't be one of those things. It would be just something that we as staff could put together and make available. So if the board is interested in having that piece added, we could easily do that. And those are the pieces that I think I'd feel more comfortable knowing. Sure. Prior to this basically being these foundational elements, which there are a lot of, being approved at the next meeting without having at least that at a minimum being outlined. Sure. Easy to do. No, and just, okay. yeah. uh, my understanding is um, this was just the plan to give staff guidance of where we're going. This isn't like a free reign here, these are the ones, make it all happen, we'll see you next year. This is just, hey, these are your focuses, so then you're not being pulled in so many different directions. Like, this is what's important to us, that's what we're agreeing upon, but it's not giving free reign to anybody to make willy-nilly decisions. Is that correct? You are correct, yes, absolutely. And, but I think Supervisor Borges will recognize that we've got very limited staff in order to put some of these pieces in play. And if you look at the timeline, which you have open on the dais, that's an aggressive timeline for implementation of a lot of these pieces, especially within the first, second, third quarter, which we're already done with the first quarter at 20 of this fiscal year. So I'm, I'm just, I'm concerned about it, knowing who's gonna be putting this to the road. And I just want all that to be thought about. Which this was the timeline that staff put together. Is that correct? Like nobody else said this needs to be done this time. This is staff's timeline. Right. And with this in play, eliminates all the extra polling and the extra things that are being asked of you. This gives you a clear direction of what's important to us. Yeah, as Supervisor Board just noted, this is kind of the, the focus from the board's perspective of what we should be involved with at the staff level. The recommendation that we've made based on the timeline, we as the strategic planning team, as your staff, believe we can deliver this. There may be some pieces that aren't able to be achieved by the end of the timeline that they're established, and that's the point of looking at this thing on a regular basis, is if something has to be carried over from one year into the next, we have the flexibility to do that. But this would be at least the focus of where we should be putting on our energy. Again, if it requires 
further board approval and consideration, we want to make that really clear to you all when you approve this so we can, we can happily and easily add that into the final plan. So let me give an example since I'm, my points aren't coming across too clearly. Uh, previous, board, previous board actions that did not result in anything and not, not talking about this board. I'm talking about when Supervisor Hemmingson served up here with me. We're very keen on creating a natural resources committee and through our community development department focus on federal lands with staffing. Because we know that by staffing the attention necessary to look at our federal lands, we know there's a cash flow component that comes down to us through SRS and PILT. Something that this board in recent memory last year took the step on through allocating dollars associated with NACO's national movement to create a 501c to focus on policy initiatives in DC that create that cash flow piece. I don't see, and I know I brought it up, but I don't see how any of these strategic planning elements that are currently listed here focus on one of those pieces that are very critical to our overall general fund cash flow. So there's things that I know we're missing that are incredibly important, yet without you teasing it apart for us all to fully understand, um, I'm, I'm just trying to understand how, it, how those things fit into this entire equation because this should be really a focus of ours. But it looks like everybody wants to take a vote. Well, I think you make a great point on that particular item. I was going to attempt to answer your question to us earlier about is there anything that you have a problem with? And, and looking at our focus areas in the report uh, one, two, three, and four, I got to say, I don't have a problem with any of them. So I was just going to pose that uh, question to you is do you see anything in here that's a deal breaker? Um, but you bring up a great point that that's that piece, SRS and PILT and, and, and uh, the federal lands piece is um, a pretty significant element that we should pay attention to. I, I completely agree with that. Um, I still feel like we are just at this time empowering staff to start putting it together and that we will have input in this process. Even though the timeline is, is aggressive, I, I don't think that we're going to be left out of this. I don't understand it that way. If, if you understand it differently, I'd love to hear from you. There's, there's nothing that I would enjoy more because I think this is an incredible idea from somebody who's served on this board for almost 10 years to do, and that's why I'm fully supportive of this process. But I don't, I'm not fully supportive of a process that rushes into something that we've needed to do for over 30 to 40 years. And I, I ask just, a, I'm going to ask another simple question. What is a jail project have to do with the economic development. Why is that under economic development and not under general government? We've, we've known, right? I mean, that just things that you think about as traditional economic development, I'm focused just on that because that's an area of interest. What, where's the cash flow generation back to the county that keeps the general fund healthy that allows us to do those pieces that we're trying to do here. So just to answer your, your simple question, the, it's actually a focus area that includes two pieces, infrastructure and economic development. And so the infrastructure piece would be the improvement of the jail and how it's tied to economic development is because within a community, the infrastructure often has an influence on the economic viability of that community and, and the, the reputation of our jail probably doesn't do us any favors in that respect. So. It's a good question, but again, it's you know what we tried to do with the focus areas was to do consolidation and find the, the area of overlap on the Venn diagram where we could. Um, it may not be a perfect fit, but we felt that it was a start. So if there's things, again, like I mentioned during the presentation that the board feels like we're missing or we have too much or the board prefers to have put it another way, we're absolutely open to that. That's why we're having this conversation and I'm appreciative of the questions. Okay, we'll bring it back to the board for a vote. Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Supervisor Howard? 
Yes. Supervisor Borges? Yes. Supervisor Short? Yes. Chair Wilson? Yes, and we look forward to seeing this next step. Thank you. Having that concluded, it brings us to our 11 o'clock time item, which we are well behind to schedule on. Um, this is to receive a presentation from the Humboldt Delnort Film Commission supporting a request for additional funding and to discuss the take possible action to increase the annual contribution of the Humboldt Delnort Film Commission as requested by the Humboldt Delnort Film Commissioner, Cassandra Hasseltine. Good morning. Uh, I'm Cassandra Hesseltine, Film Commissioner of Humboldt and Del Norte Counties, and this is Annabelle Polanco, who's my Deputy Director, who will be assisting me when my brain goes <laughs> somewhere else. <laughs> um, thanks for having us back. I know that Supervisor Howard, you'd given me an assignment. I hope I got the assignment correct. Um, you know, I did my best to kind of address some of your concerns or questions and kind of flush the story out a little bit better um, in regards to why is it important to have a film commission and why I fund it. Um, you know, one of the things I want to say is I'm always humbled when I come to these meetings because when I do sit and listen to all the decision making you have to do, it always humbles me. I'm in one niche. I have one specialty that I'm dealing with and that is bringing outside dollars to the area. So it's way more than just, ooh, Hollywood film superstars. It's about bringing outside dollars to the community. And I really learned that my first year of being a film commissioner. I definitely have worked in theater and film my whole life. And, and I love storytelling, clearly. And I, when my first year of working as the film commissioner, I realized what we really did. We brought these outside dollars to especially the Redwood region, which is, you know, a little bit of a depressed economy and can be hurting a lot of times and could use those outside dollars as well as temporary infused jobs and the vendors that are required that are needed for these productions. So as someone who's lived here now more than not in my lifetime and my deputy director born and raised here, we really do care about the community and that's really why we do this. We're not here just to say, hey, fun film. It's, it's really about what it brings to us um, and what it can do for us for all these other programs that you're having to deal with. So um, this picture, I think I brought it up last time, you know, what was fun about this one is this was a woman, Robin, who was on the FAM tour that we did um, a while back, our first FAM tour, and she also is the location manager for Barbie. And um, she did think of us, which is what we're doing is we're always investing in educating uh, film types around the world um, in regards to what we have to offer. And she thought of us years later and went, wait a minute, I have this little moment in a Harrison Ford movie where I need to have a train going north up to the Yukon. And so she sent some drone operators to come and shoot this. So again, that's part of what we do is we help with productions that will continue to come back later in time. So I'm going to go ahead and I don't know who's got the, <laughs> go to slide. Right, right there. Oh, I have it right here. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I was in the restroom. There we go. There's my little arrow. Okay. So to go back to what Supervisor Howard asked, which is basically, you know, what is the return on investment in regards to this and comparing it to Humboldt County's return on investment? I hope that that's what you were asking me for. Okay. Exactly. Um, so that being said, you know, we looked at that, you know, there's hard return on investment and there's soft. So hard is usually the dollars and most people think about what production brings when they come. I'll touch a little bit on soft because our soft is actually starting to turn into hard dollars and we're going to be um, focusing on that over the next you know, couple years here as we move forward with things like the uh, Forest Moon Festival. So obviously everybody knows you know, your net profit divided by your cost of investment times, your, uh, times 100. So looking at Del Norte first, as a reminder, um, over the, since we've represented you up until this fiscal year, I didn't include this fiscal year, uh, you, uh, the county as a whole has given us 135,000. You know, the estimated direct dollars is 1.4 million that has come in from during that time frame from film, and the indirect dollars, which is them going out to eat afterwards, having the day off, the money circulating in the economy, those kind of things. That's 4.1 million. So your percentage on direct dollars is 936%, which is a really good investment. <laughs> if I had something like that to invest in, I would do it in a heartbeat. Um, you, you're, my favorite one is your indirect dollars, which is almost 3,000%. Um, and I really, I, these numbers, you know, they're great 
And they're also great, because what story do they tell? They tell about how you've brought, given us money from TOTs, and that 1.4 didn't go exactly 100% back into the OTTs. It was dispersed throughout the county, some in Crescent City, some into the county, um, some into accommodations to go back into TOTs, some into local crew, vendors, locations. But it still was spent and put into your community. Just want to make sure that I'm not trying to paint a different picture, um, you know, and being honest about what these numbers really mean. And and though they're concrete numbers, it's also whatever we attach to it, right? So Humboldt County, uh, their return on investment, believe it or not, is lower. <laughs> They've given us one point, you know, almost eight million um, over the same amount of years. Even though we represented them longer, I just took the same amount of segments so I can compare apple to apple. And the direct dollars. Um, that have come in, you know, is 11.5-ish, um, indirectly almost 34 million. Um, and their percentage is actually um, a little bit lower than yours, which I do a comparable slide at the end, so I'll show you both of those. They've given us more money, they've re received more money, but in the end, their percentage actually is lower, ironically. So some other productions that have come into the community in Humboldt, again, it's hard to compare because I can't compare it based on like city of Arcata. I can't say this is how much city of Arcata gives us and this is how much filming they've had there and the dollars they make because productions like Wrinkle and Time stayed in city of Arcata but did not film in city of Arcata. They filmed in Eureka and Trinidad. Evening at Beverly Loughlin filmed through mostly in Eureka, but filmed also in Arcata and in Fortuna. Bird Box didn't even film in Humboldt County. They filmed here, right? And they, but they had an engineer that was hired that was take, brought up to um, to up here for for uh, a lot of the um, river scenes that had to be hired on the spot. Skies of River filled all over Humboldt County. So I can't break it down like that. Um, we aren't given those kind of numbers, nor do we have the time. If I got a lot more extra money, we could do that. <laughs> but unfortunately, we cannot do it like that. We're lucky when they do give us a pie that shows us breaking down the numbers. A lot of times I just get one number. And I say, how much did you spend in my community? And they go, this much. And I go, great. You know, and then that's what we have to work with. If they've received the tax incentive, then that's when we usually can break it down a little bit better. So some projects that are filmed here, um, again, that we helped on, and I know I brought this one up before in the past, but there's two examples that I'm going to bring up just to kind of show how we do help, and two productions that <coughs> did film predominantly and spent mo a lot of their money in um, county unincorporated areas, for instance. Um, Love in the Time of Monsters, which is a mock on um, horror movies. It's a little nod. They filmed at locations that were in unincorporated areas. They also ended up having an issue, which they were on the you know way to leaving. They called me and said, if we can't fix this, we will leave. And so our job is not only to market and not only to be boots on the ground and recommend recommendations of vendors or locations or permits, but it's to step in when there's an issue. We're literally to be a mediator, the liaison between, and we speak both languages. We'll sp we know the locals and we know what film crews need and what um, what's going on there. And so I was able to step in and keep the shoot and talk to Six Rivers National Forest and say, hey, listen, I think they're being double charged in a way. Um, and so we were able to figure out a way that worked so so that the National Forest, you know, which I was worried that feds were going to show up at my doorfront, <laughs> you know, that they, that they were happy and that the location that was on federal land but was a private location was happy and ultimately the film was happy. And so they were able to stay and they had hotel stays in unincorporated area and they spent most of that 75000 in unincorporated area. Um, Bird Box, I know I've already showed you this slide before, but again, as a reminder, this is what they do. They show us the breakdowns. A lot of this was actually, you know, a lot of took, again, place outside of, of Crescent City. Um, and as a reminder, I showed one photo to get this movie. <laughs> they asked me for an epic river with a fork in it. Don't you have one like that? And I said, oh, do I? And I showed an amazing uh, photo of the Smith River. And that came from previous work. And that's the other thing that you're getting. For the amount of dollars that you cannot fund a full-fledged film commission office to represent you with the history that we have. As a reminder, I've been president of all the film commissioners in California, which puts me in front of hundreds of location managers doing speeches, and they are fully aware of us. Um, and also, my 13 years as film commissioner, 
we had the gentleman from After Earth, and he also worked on The Revenant. He was the one that asked me, he said, don't you have you know, this river? And that's how we were able to get you know, what was the number one movie on Netflix forever. Um, so some of that, that, that comes into play. A lot of the spending, um, like I said, not only, yes, they did, a lot of people stayed in, in Crescent City, but a lot of people actually stayed outside of that. I know for a fact that Sandra Bullock stayed on a ranch, because I stayed on that ranch before she did. <laughs> and when we were scouting and trying to find a place for her, a lot of the locations were outside of Crescent City. So there is more spending when you ask, does the spending all happen in Crescent City versus the county? Um, it's a mixed bag. And, and more than you would think does actually happen outside of it. So again, Del Norte versus Humboldt County. Um, with the return on investment, here's the numbers. And you can see it's a little more than half, but almost not. You know, like when you look at the uh, indirect dollars, it's. Um, so yeah, you guys, you know, do have a lot less filming that comes into the area. Part of that is because you do only have one city, and a lot of the county is not. Um, I would say it's almost more vertical versus horizontal. It's harder to access or get to, um, but that doesn't mean people don't love it. And when we were scouting for After Earth, my first year, that was a big reason why we realized, oh, we really should represent Del Nor in addition to Humboldt. Do you think I want to have that wide of a range to cover? No. But what happens is Hollywood does not see a county boundary line. They see all groves, redwood groves. That is the number one reason why people come here. I just got back from Europe, and it was amazing to try to explain to people what, what, what we're known for, what is amazing here. And it was the trees every time. They have beautiful rocky coastline. They have amazing buildings. They have great food. It was the trees. And that is exactly why film people come here. And they don't see a county line in regards to that. So the... the it makes sense that we represent you, and you guys are definitely getting a break for having us be predominantly funded by Humboldt County, and then us including you with that. But we're at the point now where we're, it, our projects are starting to exceed what our budget is, and it's also making it harder for us to be able to scoop you into when Humboldt County is paying for something, you know, and going, oh, well, they're attached. Um, you know, we like for instance, Forest Moon Festival. Um, so that takes us to the. You know, the direct and indirect dollars is about the filming and that coming in. For a long time, we couldn't quantify film tourism. We could with how many maps were going out. It was harder for us to, um, you know, be able to show, you know, how many tourists are coming in and staying here and looking around um, where Return of the Jedi filmed. Because how would we know when someone, uh, when a family comes and does that? But now that we have the museum and people are stopping by, now that we have an app that we just built and that we're about to go public with, which will track that, and now that we have the Forest Moon Festival, we're starting to see that there is a lot more film tourism, which historically they know is supposedly can superpass, you know, the amount of dollars from filming that comes in. Um, and so, you know, soft returns, like the fact that you had Return of the Jedi here, that is 40 years of bringing tourists here that, you know, has been spending dollars. So us pulling together the Forest Moon Festival will really help us figure out how much of that's really um, showing. And this was a magazine that we actually got you guys in back in 2015. So there's another soft return. There's many ways that we showcase you. And that was an international location magazine that went out to all location managers around the world for filming. So that's... Just one of the many ways we try to represent you. So I hope that helps paint the picture a little bit better um, of what we do, how we do it, why we do it. Um, we can't make promises. Anything you invest in us, we can't say, oh, tomorrow we'll have, you know, that's not how this works. It's, it's about accumulatively all of those years that we have represented you is you know, we're educating. And like I said, Robin came on a fam tour and like five years later brought a Harrison Ford, you know, two day little, um, it's called plates. What they did with the drone was take the plates and then add the train to it. Um, so we never know what's gonna happen. And the industry's obviously changing with strikes and AI and all the things that are going on. So I, I won't lie to you and make a promise and say, oh, give me, you know, so much X more and we'll, you know, provide this. Um, but what I can say is we work our butts off for you, and we really do care about this community, and we see that you, you definitely need the resources for other important things, and we get our part in it. So that's that. Do you have any questions? <laughs> you, I, I do have just a quick question about the dollars. How did you come up with the um, indirect dollar amount? How is that figure factored? So the California Film Commission gives us that formula. So according to them, um, statistically, it's for every dollar that is spent by production. So that's just on like locations, 
vendors, crew, local, not their outside, not, not talking about their crew that they bring in. Um, it's that direct dollar spent. You, if for every dollar that they do that, it translates to $2.95. So you multiply their, the direct dollars by two, $2.95. Um, and then the $2.95 counts for, they usually only get breakfast and lunch on set. They, so if you've got, like for instance, when you had Bird Box here, you had 351 crew members going out to dinner. And you know the brewery stayed open. A lot of a few of the different places had to open on Sunday because you had 350 crew members, you know, and a lot of them didn't want to make dinner, you know, even if they had a kitchen in their accommodations. Um, and then they had days off, you know, when they have a day off, if they work five or six days out of the week and they're here for months, which a lot of the productions are in pre-production besides the days of filming, and then they stay afterwards to wrap out. They're here two, three months when it's a big movie like that. They have days off, so they go out again and they're spending money. And then the money circulates within the economy three times. Again, this is outside dollars that comes in and does all of that before it leaves. So that's the indirect dollar amount. And that's what it really feels like before it leaves. And it accounts for the direct dollars within that amount too. So it's not on top of, just to be clear. Thank you. Any other questions? I'll hold my to public comment. Okay. I don't, I don't have a question, but I do have something I'd like to share with the board. It's just a Facebook comment. After our last conversation, um, I was tagged in a comment where somebody was saying, what is the board thinking? Of course, you know, but this is a good investment. But it was anecdotal. So I was like, Can, do you have any facts, figures? Can you, you know, tell me where you got this information? And uh, the reply was still largely anecdotal, but I, would, I just wanted to share it with the board um, just as a piece of information from somebody in the community. Um, it's from, it says, from my personal experience, I was paid over $4,000 for working the film. I know of seven other locals hired for locations and at least two other locals hired for other departments. Uh, the the Hayuchi Cafe was always busy, as was Seaquake. Both could help with the information on this as well. At one point, the entire first unit had lunch at Seaquake, hundreds of us. Speaking of which, the Hayuchi campground was also packed with studio trucks. Hotels were filled with people working the film. Hell, the first week here, we had people hitting every store in town for rain gear. The entire, <laughs> the entire town was sold out for a week. Uh, I know that several homeowners were paid in the thousands for use on their property and homes for the production. Specifics are confidential, but uh, some homeowners were paid quite a bit. Um, I know every one of those people working the film spent uh, money in our county and in Curry County. They went out to dinner and drinks after wrap each day, and I've seen a few return to the area talking about the soft return. So mm -hmm. um, in response to that, you know, trying to verify the validity of, you know, it, it, we saw it on Facebook, so it must be true kind of thing. Um, I talked to, have, had to go sign checks at uh, Chalwell Benz and Hartwick, talked to Matt Wakefield and Kevin Hartwick about business at Seaquake and uh, Matt said, oh, are you talking about Bird Box? Oh yeah, we did very well. We did very well at Bird Box and I, I can imagine that the money that came into the county was in the millions of dollars. So um, just wanted to let the board know that I did get that one piece of confirmation from this bit of information on Facebook. And I just wanted to share that with you guys for your consideration. And before you go to public comment, um, I just wanted to ask what, I don't know, maybe you mentioned it, what's the current investment and what is the ask for an investment? I don't know if you mentioned that or not. It, it, it has varied over the years. It's basically whatever the pass through that comes through that has been able to been applied to us. So it's varied everything from, I think the minimum, I think was 5,000. I don't remember if it went lower. And the highest I think that we were ever given was roughly 15-ish. Um, we're at 10 right now currently. Um, you know, so 10 to market, be the boots on the ground and throw a festival, all those things is kind of, you know, in 2024, a little rough. Um, you know, we get, I don't presume to know what your guys' financial, you know, uh, situation is. Obviously, you know, it's probably tough. And so ideally, 
uh, any increase is great. You know, c would we would love you know to be able to walk away and have twenty five thousand total? Sure, uh, twenty five thousand on top of ten, absolutely. You know, if you want to go a hundred thousand, go for it. You know, I mean, whatever whatever we can do. And I get again, I can't promise that the return on investment is going to happen this year. It might take a couple years. So, um, and it sounds like you guys have a lot of things that you have to do with your money. So we're just asking for to us a necessary increase for our lane where we're at to do a better job for you. So did you want to put a dollar on that or you want us to come I up believe the dollar? the dollar that we put on there, Mr. Lopez, uh, was uh, 20, well, 25 including the 10, correct? Yes. So 35 is what you're asking for? No, it included the 10. Included. So I guess 15 uh, was what we, what we negotiated. So your current ask yes. at ideal would be 25 total. Correct. Yeah, there's a 10 that passes through the Visitors Bureau. It's decided by um, them, which is, they've been great to work with. Cindy's been amazing. Um, I love working with them. I obviously don't want to tax them, which is why I came to you for more, uh, you know, more of a budget, uh, an increase. Yeah. Yeah. So just sitting on the Visitor Bureau, I know that every year when we um, go through our budget, we decide like how much we're able to allocate toward the film commission. Um, so it, are you asking for us to still do that allocation? How would this look? Would the, the county then increase the Visitor Bureau budget by 15 and then we're asking them to do that? Or is this going to be some direct funding to the film commission and bypass the Visitor Bureau? I, I guess I'm asking our, our CAO. Yeah. So. yeah. I think that could, uh, that could happen either way, actually, Supervisor Starkey. It depends on what the board direction is. If you'd like something directly to go to the Film Commission outside of the pass through the Visitor, Visitor Bureau, then the, the budget team will just work on that. It can go through the Visitor's Bureau and uh, be passed through the same way the current funding is. Um, I would suggest or recommend a direct uh, payment to the Film Commission if you guys decided to increase that amount. That's what I'm thinking, is that a direct to the Film Commission? Because, again, it, then it becomes somewhat you know, up to the Visitor Bureau budget, mm -hmm. right? So if we were to do something, I would think that a direct payment from the county to the Film Commission would seem to be make the most logical sense and consistency for your organization. So Consistency is lovely and whatever is best for both entities, you know, is what we would want for you guys. Thank you. Okay. Is there any public comment on this issue? I, I would prefer it go through the Visitors Bureau any funding. Um, so the Visitors Bureau and the Chamber are joined uh, by members of the Board of Supervisors, the City Council, and the Harbor. And it makes the Visitors Bureau and the Chamber of Commerce Brown Act boards when they have membership from the government bodies and funding. And so it allows us a little peek into the, um, so if we start seeing that the Visitors Bureau and the Chamber keep your membership but lose your funding, you know, they'll become uh, quieter boards. Off season, yeah, bird box. I our, our sales went went up. It was off season. We had all kinds of cast members coming in. I don't trust you guys to give out money from our general fund when you de when you decline my funds. To be honest, you know, and you don't seem to understand. You know, six percent of nothing is nothing. Um, at the time, we were patients together, so we weren't subject to your guys' tax. But uh, when you, you know, voted to set my tax every year, you took a business that would have took some of this money that's supposed to be circulating through our community, and you, know, you, you took it out. So I wouldn't trust you guys really to fund any sort of business, to be honest. Uh, but if you do, I'd appreciate it if it goes to the Chamber or Visitors Bureau, um, or if we stop funding the Chamber and Visitors Bureau, I think we should also stop our membership you know, on our bodies with it. Thank you. Hello, Angela Greeno. I was watching it on YouTube and I'm like, I have to comment because Cassandra and her team are amazing. What they did last year for the Forest Moon Festival was amazing. So full disclosure, complete Star Wars fan because we filmed Return of the Jedi here. I heard the stories growing up of all the film crew, of the teachers, the substitute teachers who were casting and all this stuff. And that's what made me a Star Wars fan. That blew up into a huge group from around the world. I don't know how many times this week alone 
I have been following visitor guides and all these people on Facebook who are already planning their summer trips. And of course, I'm plugging the Forest Moon Festival. People are like, well, where was this filmed? I want to see it. Totally plug in Cassandra's map. They do an excellent job. Of course, the common question is, where's the bunker? But <laughs> how to say that's private but you can check out our national resources you can check out our national parks there's so many other places you can come people from around the world come just for Star Wars I know it's crazy but then it's great too for like Jurassic Park Bird Box when we talk about other films that were filmed in the area so what you're getting is a huge investment for that little tiny money that she's asking for it, it's a huge investment because it just brings so many people to our region. I always tell people when they want to do Avenue of the Giants and just hang out in Humboldt, it's like, no, come further north. There's more up here. There's so much more. Come up, actually see where, sorry, where Endor was filmed. <laughs> there was some, yes, in Humboldt County. Um, but come up, see Smith River. Come and see these areas. And people do. I mean, it is a worldwide thing. So just for that 15000 extra, it's really going to be a return on investment for the community. Um, I love seeing the National Parks is now starting to go with some Forest Moon Festival stuff. People are planning. People from Germany, New Zealand, Australia, uh, Japan, they're coming here to see our redwoods because no one else in the world has these beautiful trees, has this beautiful economy. Right with your strategic plan that you're talking about, economic development, tourism, 15,000 more. Give a little bit more, you're going to see a return on investment. You might not see it in you know, all the TOT, you might see it in just your economy growing in Del Norte County. So I just wanted to come up, who was watching on YouTube, like, I have to come and advocate for Cassandra. So thank you. Good morning. I'm actually here to comment about tri-agency, but I got tired of sitting. Um, <laughs> so I do have something to add to this. Um, my son got em employed as a production assistant on Bird Box, um, which was good money. I think he worked with Anibal. You know Donovan? Yep, Donovan Hendrick. Um, not only the money was good, and, but just the experience of working on a big production like that, it was such a boost to his career and to his ego. Um, and he's gotten other jobs through the Film Commission um, that are smaller jobs, but um, commercials, types of things that a TV show, he worked on a TV show that was filmed at Trees of Mystery. So there's, there's um, lots of benefits besides the money that comes back to the county, the money that comes into the community, of course, gets spent in the community. And um, so I, I just, um, I think for the amount of money they're asking for, the investment is, is well worth your consideration, and um, and I'm glad to have a chance to stand up and stretch my legs. So I'll, I'll come back <laughs> later. <laughs> Any other public comment? Seeing none, bring it back to the board. The only, the only comment I do have is, do you guys not like ET? Nobody, Nobody mentioned E.T. Nobody was yell E.T. when Angela was talking. But Nobody was saying E.T. I, I, come on. No, no. We have a marker for E.T. and we actually bring that up. And we actually have a stuffed E.T. in the museum. We do talk about E.T. all the time in the museum when we tell people to come up here and visit. I'll make the motion to approve the $15,000 ask. I have a motion. Is there a second? I, I want to make sure that it's directed the right way. I know there's some discussion about that, and I'm not sure if, if you believe it directly needs to go to the commission or through the Visitors Bureau. Having seen the fluctuations over time, actually having been there originally as board president of the Chamber of Commerce when this was initiated, those investments um, have fluctuated based on the investment of county and city dollars and tr sometimes tribal dollars to keep the Visitors Bureau afloat and more importantly grow that return on investment. I think arguably uh, we've seen significant return on investment since originally investing in the Visitor Bureau of which the ancillary pieces associated <coughs> with the Film Commission it's clear just based on the presentation today. I just um, I believe it's a good suggestion to continue running that but make sure that we make direction through 
the visitors bureau because I think that's the most consistent path but make our will as a board known instead of direct like our CAO suggested I don't believe it should be direct I think it should be through the visitors bureau like it's been for the last 13 14 years see and I disagree but what I could suggest today is perhaps the staff could bring it back before the board with the pros and cons of each um, I do think that when we give our chunk of money to the visitor bureau and then they're able to distribute it as they wish you can't really tell them how to spend their money once we kind of give it to them i i, I think what you're saying is that we would allocate twenty five thousand. we expect twenty five thousand to go to them i don't know if that's necessarily the right path perhaps if we just do a direct donation might be better served for everyone but i would love to hear more from staff as to the two choices I, th I do believe that we've got some consensus that we'd like to see the increase to 25,000 total. Um, how that's allocated, yeah. I think, is we would need a little bit more information. It's, it's, I, I get, it goes back to, to the public comment. It's the oversight piece that is important because the Visitors Bureau, we're not interacting directly with the commission. The Visitors Bureau is interacting directly with the commission on a monthly or yearly basis. And so I want to maintain that consistency because the Visitors Bureau and the Chamber of Commerce report directly back to the board as being one of the funding sources. Plus, as was pointed out, there's representation on that body. Without, with the direct funding component, then we would require, just like we do with the Chamber of Commerce and the Visitors Bureau, an annual report. I'm certain Cassandra would be willing to do that, but I'm trying to maintain some consistency here. So then I guess I'll, I'll amend my motion to approve the additional $15,000 uh, donation or an investment into the, this, but to have staff come back with the two different options to, so we can weigh pros and cons and make our decision there. Yeah, second that motion. We have a motion and a second. Hold the vote, please. Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Supervisor Short? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Supervisor Borges? Yes. Chair Wilson? Yes. And thank you, Cassandra. That was pretty enlightening. We all appreciate it. Good job. Good job, guys. You got to take a break? Okay. <laughs> it's 12 o'clock. We're only going to take a five minute break.
session. We'll take up items 16 and 17. Approve and adopt a budget transfer 0401 to the amount of $29,248 within the county service area number one budget and allow for the purposes of preparing a hazard mitigation program, uh, sub application, and construct fixed generators and protective structures at sanitary sewer lift stations as requested by the Director of Community Development, and also adopt and approve a budget transfer 0402 to the amount of $29,248. Uh, within the American Rescue Act planned fund to allow the transfer of funds to the county service area number one fund for the purpose of preparing a hazard mitigation grant program, sub application to construct fixed generators and protective structures to the sanitary lift station as requested by the Director of Community Development. Move to approve as read. Second. Any public comment on these issues? Seeing none, bring it back to the board for vote. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Supervisor Short? Yes. Supervisor Borges? Yes. Chair Wilson? Yes. Now we'll move on to the legislative and budget issues. Uh, consider miscellaneous legislative and budget matters per pertinent to the County of Del Norte. Authorize the Chair to sign and send appropriate letters in respect to matters pending before the state and federal governments. Number 18, contingent upon the passage of items 16 and 17 corresponding budget transfers. Approve and authorize the chair to execute a second amend, uh, amendment of agreement to professional services for on-site emergency power supply and sanitary lift stations with GHD Inc. for the preparation of hazard mitigation grant program sub-application and authorize the community development department to submit a hazard mitigation grant program sub-application. And number three, authorize the community uh, development director to sign a sub-application and support documents on behalf of the county of Del Norte, service area number one, as requested by the assistant county engineer. Is there a specific question or do you want me to go over the project? Is there any questions from the board on this issue? I was just about to make the motion that uh, we go ahead and approve items one, two, and three as read into the record. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any public comment on this? Seeing none, please pull the vote. Supervisor Borges? Yes. Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Supervisor Short? Yes. Chair Wilson? Yes. Good job. Long overdue. <laughs> And now we take up number 19, discuss and take action on the motion to suspend the rules of order to allow the board to reconsider item number 29, the tri-agency joint powers agreement, JPA uh, amendment uh, from the January 23rd, 2024 uh, Board of Supervisors meeting. Uh, County Council, you want to, uh, is there any, you want to describe what we're doing here? Um, yes, I do believe that the board report kind of outlines the process. Essentially, um, the board has taken action um, on the JP already. Um, as a result, uh, it has been asked to bring that same item back to the board. Um, in order to do that, based on the Rosenberg rules, which are the rules that this board has adopted that govern uh, these meetings, um, because that motion to reconsider wasn't taken at the January 23rd meeting. Um, first, the board needs to uh, okay, uh, agree on suspending the rules, um, which will require a four-fifths vote. If the board uh, agrees to do that, then you would move on to item number 20, which would be uh, to take up a motion to reconsider that just requires a majority vote, so three out of five. Um, and if that is approved, then you would move on to item number 21 and uh, reconsider the uh, tri-agency joint powers agreement, um, specifically looking at whether or not uh, the board wants to remove section 5.05E, um, which was added uh, at the request of the board um, at the January 23rd meeting. And if there's any questions, I can answer. Uh, I can answer them. I do believe, however, the board report um, does a great job of succinctly uh, 
explaining exactly what happened. Um, this would be the third time that this board will be looking at this uh, JPA agreement. Um, and I, I do believe that the board report outlines uh, what is required. And ultimately, uh, Mr. Chair, um, you being the chair, uh, you're the one that controls um, the way that this item's taken up and uh, the way that the board should uh, consider the, the situation. Appreciate it, thank you. Bring it back to the board. Mr. Chairman, could I ask Jackie a question real quick? If, if we were to vote to spend rules and to reconsider, we would be considering the exact same item as was considered before. But if the tri-agency were to bring us different language, talking about JPA agreement, different language, that we wouldn't have to do the suspending of the rules and motion to reconsider at a later time? Is that correct? You're correct. Um, it would be a completely different item. It would have to go through the whole process again with all the different agencies and all of that. But at this time, the board has considered the exact same language that is presented in item number 21. Um, I believe it was at the November meeting. Um, there was direction given to staff at that meeting, come back in January, and the board approved uh, the JPA um, agreement uh, with that section 5.05E. It Thank went, you. Yeah. I just wanted to make that abundantly clear. Appreciate that. I mean, it's within the board report. Um, it's specifically uh, directing that the tri agency will not uh, participate in wind energy. Um, advocate the type first. and advocate and whatnot wind en energy. So we have the presentation to the board. Any comments and or motions? Having none? Public comment. Yeah, public comment. I stand before you with a sense of disbelief and frustration. It seems that our esteemed governing bodies have once again found themselves entangled in a web of inconsistency and hypocrisy. Let's rewind to November 21st, 2023, where the rules were seemingly just fine we placed restrictions on the JPA tri-agency bylaws, believing uh, you were acting in the best interest of our community. On January 4th, um, the tri-agency board expressed that it was a, that the restriction on the wind, uh, oceanic wind farms um, was necessary compromise in order to ensure the support of its member agencies. Fast forward to uh, January 23, uh, 2024. Um, you all approved of the bylaws effectively eliminating the offshore wind farm discussions or project. But the harbor and the city said, oh no, we're gonna keep it. Well, at that point, guess what? There was no tri-agency anymore because you just deleted yourself. You all three gotta agree on that. So, with that said, this is what happens in our county when we suspend the rules, okay? Let me give you some examples. Uh, $73,000 of embezzlement from the harbor district by the former, um, Harbor Baster, uh, the, the county auditor and the district attorney, they suspended the rules and just said, oh, well, that's just, you know, internal weakness. Last weekend, we had a murder on Easter weekend. And so what's the DA do? She releases the guy and, because why? We're going to suspend the rules. So we got murder, we got embezzlement, and now we've got the board deciding, oh, well, this, Let's just, suspend the, let's just suspend the rules. 
Well, why do we even have them? If you guys can't make a decision and stand by your decision, there's something very wrong. The trial agency is a failure. They have done nothing to try and uh, demonstrate transparency to the public, have not gotten a website, refused to get a website, got $41,000 in the bank and refused to get a website for transparency of the public. And now you're sitting here and you want to suspend the rules. Well, I don't even know why we have laws. We're just going to suspend them. That's why this county is in such grave disrepair. Hello again. I do think it's unfortunate that so much time and energy has been spent debating the pros and cons of offshore wind. Instead, the Tri-Agency should start to focus on implementing the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategic Plan, which is the action plan for collaboration to, to establish shared goals for economic development in our county. The SEDS was prepared under a joint effort with the Crescent City, Del Norte County, and the Harbor District, and contains an action plan with unrealized goals and objectives that the Tri-Agency could take on. Here are a few examples that I like. Here's the plan, in case you haven't seen it. You probably should read it. There's lots of good stuff in there. First of all, goal one, diversify the regional economy to include technology-based firms, light manufacturing, and healthcare enterprises that provide living, wage, li living wages to local workers. The SEDS proposes to attract internet commuters and to ensure adequate capacity and redundancy from broadband network. We learned through the COVID that people can work here, be here and work other places. But who's working on this? That's my question for you. The focus on healthcare, attract and expand a greater range of specialty healthcare services, create an inventory of healthcare services available in Del Norte County, identify healthcare gaps and determine the constraints of filling these gaps, maximize the opportunity for local healthcare training programs. This effort needs more attention. Goal five, enhance education, workforce training, housing and healthy lifestyle opportunities in Del Norte County. This includes supporting expansion of career technical education programs in our K through 12 schools, attracting or developing additional vocational education programs focused on skills needed by local industry as well as future technology industries. We need to make more progress on this. The SEDS recommends housing actions to prepare market information that can help attract developers to build more workforce housing as well as evaluating local zoning and permitting. Lack of affordable workforce housing is a major impediment to economic development. This must be addressed with more urgency. This is only a sampling of the actions that the city and the county and the harbor could take through Tri-Agency. If Tri-Agency fades away, who will do this work? I just heard earlier today the county has no economic development services. Is it not important to you? If you're going to not support Tri-Agency, what is your plan for economic development? So don't get hung up on this win thing. It's a small thing in a really big issue. Um, just, just today, you approved an action that was in the SEDS. I was so thrilled to see it. Backup power on your lift stations. It's in the SEDS. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You did. <laughs> Um, I am done, but I ask you to reconsider your vote, approve the JPA so Trigens can continue to move ahead and lead economic development in our region. Thank you. I, you know, I, the Tri Agency, I, I've been able to go to a couple of the meetings since they started posting them lately. Um, we do have other, you know, how do we get doctors up here? We have a healthcare district. Nobody showed up to it. You know, we, we actually had it on the agenda. How are we going to recruit, retain? 
and market to doctors, you know, at the healthcare district, but I was the only one there, to be honest. You know, they have a million dollar budget, they use half of it for pool passes and a bike pump track, you know. And so we have these boards, but they're neglected. And so I'm afraid they're like pets, and we're going to get another one, and it's going to be neglected. I also, uh, the harbor master called me back about something not regarding this. And, you know, obviously he'd been fielding a lot of calls about wind energy. And for whatever reason, I have really no opinion on it, except for that's been developing over time. You know, as you see, different people have different opinions. Uh, but he said that the tri-agency was going to dissolve because uh, you guys couldn't agree on, on wind energy. But that kind of leads us to the idea that that's all that they're for then, is for the wind energy idea. If they can't uh, live without wind energy, then what are we forming them for if, if we're not there yet? And I think my opinion on wind energy has developed to, to, to coincide with the tribes and the fishermen, people who sometimes are a little odds, and uh, all of a sudden, we kind of have a whole bunch of people saying, maybe we don't need to solve the energy crisis at the UNESCO World Heritage Site on the Pacific Coast. We, you know, we are the only Pacific Coast UNESCO World Heritage Site. You know, maybe it'd be better solved in Humboldt County or Oregon or, you know, in other areas. This is, you know, they call it a universal, outstanding universal value is what they determined Redwood National Park to be. And it's the only one on the Pacific Coast. So I'm all for wind energy. I don't know why we would have to jump in. We already solved people's timber problems, gold problems, all kinds of problems from this county. I don't know why we would rush to try and get Shell to bid to sell us the wind now that they've sold too much oil. You know, that can be solved in other places. Um, but, uh, um, you know, the, the tri it hasn't been a real transparent board. And we do have, we, you know, that's why I say we, we should run our money through the chamber and visitors bureau while we have membership with them to keep them a transparent board. And those are economic development uh, entities that have membership from the harbor city and county. And, uh, you know, I, I just think you guys are going to get another pet and it's going to get neglected, but thanks. Any other public comment? Okay, seeing none, bring it back to the board. So I just want to, if I could share, I'm sorry, I just started talking. Um, so I, I really, for me, it's we got to bifurcate this. We have to break it down. Number 19 that we're talking about right now is the motion to suspend the rules. That's the only thing that we need to be talking about right this second. And that's, are we going to suspend the rules? And the rules that we're suspending is that this is brought back to us for a motion to reconsider that wasn't timely. So it, um, we made the, I was absent at that meeting, but the January 23rd meeting was the final decision for this JPA. And what the board report doesn't say is who's bringing it back. Um, I'm, I'm assuming it was somebody in the majority, which was all four of you gentlemen. So given the fact that all we're talking about in number 19 is to suspend the rules to be able to bring back the motion to reconsider that's i i just want to remind us that's we got to focus on that of whether or not this warrants us suspending the untimely return for the motion to reconsider so and i i i will make the motion to suspend the rules in order to allow us to do a motion to reconsider We have a motion. Is there a second? Mr. Chairman, I don't know if it's second, but I just wanted to say that uh, I, I do have hopes that Tri-Agency will function and be a successful agency. I mean, I know they can be. We see that with our harbor, Citizens Dock, the broadband that we have. Um, but I am not willing to waver on my position that we need to protect our fishing fleet and our fisheries. Um, so I would just, I just wanted to say that I, I would hope that the tri-agency would bring back something to us with different language in the bylaws. And I understand that there's two other agencies we have to deal with. I get that, but I'm not willing to, uh, waver on my position of, uh, protection of our fisheries. So I am not willing to suspend the rules at this time. I just want to add that although I'm in favor of suspending the rules, I don't want there any doubt 
that when it came to item number 20, that I was going to be supportive of that. But I do feel that a motion to suspend the rules is separate from item 20 and 21. So I wanted to, um, I did not want to give the appearance that by suspending the rules that I somehow was in favor of the board um, changing their vote when nothing new has been brought forward. So I'm gonna second Valerie's motion because we're off track as she clearly stated but I also want this board to consider how we got here and I think in these cases we need a little bit of direction so we as members of the JPA are currently acting fairly siloed when we should be acting fairly jointly as members of the JPA with the harbor and the city and so when we took action last year collectively in the same room to ensure that the tri-agency continued to exist that moved forward we had negotiations here specific to the bylaws which two of the member agencies didn't agree to so we're now bringing it back and because two member agencies are potentially changing one point in the bylaw that could stop here today and the very thing that potentially you feared occurring could happen, which is all of a sudden this agency is now in limbo. And so I don't want to see that happen here today. This agency functioned quite well prior to some of the issues that were under a director previously in 2012. But other than that, they've done good work prior to the date. And as previously stated, we need economic development here. The county has limited to no capacity to implement that without additional staffing and for the small investment that we do make annually to bring those pieces on board. Um, I don't think it's going to get done. So my hope is, is that we'll make the motion as recommended and move forward with our next discussion. So what, what is the point of having rules? I don't understand this. Like, we sat and debated for an hour about this, and we made a decision. Everyone else saw our decision, and they decided to go against us. Why are we coming back to suspend the rules so we can change our vote? Because they decided to change, not agree with us. Let them suspend the rules and change their vote. I don't understand what we're doing here. Why, why even sit up here and make these decisions if we're just going to keep coming back and again and then change it? What is the point of this? Mr. Chairman, if I could. Yeah. Just, um, I understand the, the parliamentary procedure piece of this and suspending the rules, just in answer to your question, because there, there are occasions where there are a change of heart or there is some new information that, is, that has been provided. And I don't believe that we've gotten that today. And that's just my opinion. And uh, that's the reason I'm not in favor of suspending the rules. Yeah, and again, it, it's pretty clear, I think, to everybody, um, yeah. is that the reason why we find ourselves in this position is strictly because we did send our MOU back and then they rejected it, uh, both the harbor and the city. And so the only way that we could uh, look at or even consider that return back to us is to waive the, these rules, and that's what we're faced with on the night on the vote of the 19th. We have a motion to second. We pull the vote, please. Supervisor Short? No. Supervisor Borges? No. Supervisor Howard? Abstain. Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Chair Wilson? No. So we have uh, that uh, ends the need for 20 or 21 at this time um, and we will take up item number 22 which is uh, for DHSS approve their salary range adjustment of attachment A for the social services branch in an effort to address the current staffing crisis as requested by the director of DHSS and uh, behavioral health recommended by the county administrative officer and to authorize human resources and Auditor Controller's Office to revise applicable salary schedules, job posting, and complete, complete, complete 
any process is necessary to implement the board's approval as requested by the county administrative officer and auditor controller. Move to Oof. approve. We have a motion to approve. Is there a second? Yes, second. And is there any public comment? So, yeah, we want to keep our staff, right? So this is a great decision. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Since this is your department, do you want to, is there anything you were going to say or you're good? <laughs> okay. I just, yeah. good afternoon, board. I just really appreciate the support through this. And, you know, these are a very vulnerable population that these staff are serving. Um, so again, I, I just appreciate your consideration of this item and um, administration's um, time that they took to have this discussion and get to the point where we are here today. And I know social services branch is in real bad need of, of <laughs> staffing. So yeah, appreciate it. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Pull vote, please. Supervisor Howard. Abstain. Supervisor Borges? Yes. Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Supervisor Short? Yes. Chair Wilson? Yes. 23, received copies of letters uh, provided by state legislators from the Director of Health and Human Services per section 160 of the Administrative Manual as requested by the Director of Health and Human Services. Move to approve. Have motion to approve? There's nothing there. I think it's no, just, don't uh, we okay. accept. Receive. <laughs> accept. If we do need a motion, I, I would second that. I thought it was uh, <laughs> an, and 24. an action item. Okay. Approve uh, attachment A as reclassification of intake worker one, two, and three at the health uh, program specialist one and two at the DHSS uh, public health branch as requested by the director of DHSS. And two, approve uh, attached classification description of a newly requested health program specialist one and two. And three, uh, authorize human resources to update the public health staffing chart applicable salary schedule and all other necessary administrative steps to reflect the board's approval of the recommended by the county administrative officer. Move to approve this one as well. Motion, is there a second? I'll second. Motion to second, any public comment on 24? Saying none? I, I, oh. I just have a question. Go ahead. How, question. Is, how come there's only one intake worker? Is that, is that all we have? Yeah, there's only one allocation uh, it's specific to one program in DHHS and so um, this you know then we no longer have that intake worker reclassifying it to this public health specialist is really going to help us for the long run as far as being a broader position um, to work in different uh, programs as well as the expanded responsibilities and roles that the intake worker has kind of morphed into so bigger job duties yes. increased pay obviously yes. I would assume goes with it but yes. more responsibilities. Yes. Okay. Okay. That was all I had. Any other questions? Okay. We have a motion and a second. Pull the vote, please. Supervisor Borges? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Supervisor Short? Yes. Chair Wilson? Yes. That concludes our uh, agenda for today. Thank you for your participation and hope to see you next time.